Right, so for those that are listening, this is a bit of pre-game discussion that we're going to have. The, the pre-gens that I've put together can be slightly tweaked and customised here and there. And as they're also beefed up a little bit from starting PC level, um, they're going to have roughly taken place about five investigations before this scenario starts. So they'll have castle upgrades accordingly. So I've selected a list for each PC that's relevant to their occupation stroke archetype and that they can then discuss between them what, the, what they want. So we'll do talents first. because We've got a starting talent, which I've selected, and then given you an option of ones that are specific to your archetype and also then a list of general talents, which are also related. So just going through alphabetically, we'll start with the doctor. Uh, you've got your chief physician one already. Mm -hmm. Uh, what of the other talents, which one would you like? I'm going to go with emergency medicine. So when I'm performing medicine, I ignore mental conditions. Gotcha. Probably should rewind uh, a bit then from thinking, because uh, certain of these are going to have mechanical terms that not everyone is familiar with, unless you've played Year Zero games before. So a quick overview of how the basic mechanics of the game work. On your character sheet, the last page in the PDF that was sent across, on your right-hand side, you'll have sections which are marked attributes, resources, conditions, and skills. Almost always, when I'm going to be calling for you to make a role, it will be for a skill role, in which case you've got agility, close combat, force, medicine, etc., going down that part of the sheet. In brackets next to it, it has the associated stat. You roll both together. So if I ask for agility and it has physique after it, you're rolling a number of dice equal to your agility skill plus your physique so, uh, score as well. So, for example, I've got the academics pre-gen sheet up here. Um, she has one agility and three physique, so she'd be rolling four dice. Now... In the section above skills, you've got conditions. If you fail a skill roll, you have the option of what's called pushing the roll, which is where you essentially exert yourself or you take mental strain, however you wish to narrate it happening, and then roll any dice that you've rolled previously for that check that didn't come up as a six. Sixes are successes. Uh, they're not subtracted by ones or anything like that. It's just a straight six is a success. The vast majority of the time, you'll only be looking for one success. But if a role is particularly difficult, then it might require two successes. Or if it's very difficult, it might require three successes. Uh, they'll be flagged at the time as to what you need and how many successes you, you require for a particular role. You generally select the first three of either physical or mental conditions first. When you get to broken, that's pretty damn horrible for you. Either you're falling unconscious or you're kind of being battered and bruised and ripped apart. Um, in an ongoing game, you would potentially pick up severe and ongoing permanent injuries from those things. So things like maybe you've lost a leg, lost an arm. Uh, there's a whole table full of different critical injury uh, results that you roll for when you, when you tick off that broken option. They're divided into physical and mental conditions. For each condition that you have, it's minus one dice off any dice pool that relates to those particular linked stats. So your physical attributes are physique and precision. Uh, precision. Your mental attributes are logic and empathy. So if you've got, and it's cumulative, so if you've got physical, let's say, exhausted and battered ticked, that's minus two dice off any of your physique and precision base rolls. If you've got just angry ticked on mental, then it's just one off your logic or empathy based rolls. There's another type of role which will almost certainly come up, which is quite central to the game, which is called a fear check. Uh, think of it as sanity check in Call of Cthulhu terms. When that's asked for, there's a number of different mo um, modifiers which are going to come up in, in play. You choose to either roll a number of dice equal to your logic or empathy. 
And as members of the, of the society and as player characters, you get a plus one bonus up to a maximum of plus three for every other PC that's with you. That can stack with certain talents like Brave or Safety in Numbers. Brave gives you a plus one. Safety in Numbers gives you another modifier based on how many people are with you. But it stacks on top of that ordinary rule of your friends with you up to a maximum of plus three. So you could be rolling quite a few dice. Um, example with, again, the academic has a logic of five, has an empathy of three. We'll go with the five because it gives you the more dice, so more chance of success. If she's got three other people with her, then that's an additional plus three. If she's got the brave talent, that's an additional plus one. They all stack and give more and more dice. Normally, one success is good, but creatures have, or basin have, what's called a fear rating, where if the higher that number, that's the number of successes you need to get. If you don't reach that number of successes, the number of successes that you get subtract from that total and you take conditions based on what's left so example you have a creature with a fear rating of two you roll one success on your uh, fear roll you get the one remaining so two minus one it's got one you take that many conditions on your sheet and roll one d6 to show um to show how long that's going to last basically how long you are flipping out that could be that you end up uh, fainting cowering in fear, running away, attacking the beast uh, irrationally. It's up to you to decide how you wish to react. It's a bit like a sanity check in a lot of ways. Uh, there's one other way you can help bo boost your dice rolls for skill, skill checks, and that's called getting an advantage. Uh, there's various steps that investigations in Basin are quite structured, that you get a chance usually towards the beginning of the scenario when you know what's going on and you can start preparing. You can start to think, well, I'm, if I'm going out into the woods and I'm going to be hunting creatures, maybe I want to get, uh, maybe I want to brush up on my range combat skills. You choose a particular skill which you want to get a one time, one single use plus two bonus on a roll. And it's just a quick th a descriptive thing that you, ch you tell me as the GM. For instance, using like the hunter as the example, um, before we head out into the woods, I'm getting out my gun, I'm cleaning it thoroughly, giving it a good polish, checking the sights, and say, I want to allocate my advantage to my range combat role. Yeah. Uh, people have certain bits of equipment already listed on the sheet. The reference PDF, which I've sent across, has the list of equipment. Because it's a very set list. Certain equipment gives a certain bonus in a particular situation. So you'll have the bonus as the plus, usually between plus one and plus three on the equipment sheet. There's an availability rating next to it, which I'll get to in a second, because that relates to resources. And then you have the description of when that particular bonus applies and to what particular roles it applies to, going down the right-hand side of those, of those tables. Uh, for example, you've got, uh, again, the academic has a book collection, which gives a plus one bonus to learning roles in a particular situation. Not counted as part of equipment, but counted as an item which is mentioned in your backgrounds is a memento. Our example, again, for the, the academic is it's her journals. This is where she writes down all of her notes about her various findings, her research and so on, got working for her magnum opus. A memento is an item which you can say at one point during the game when you've got usually a, a free or quiet moment when you're not like in the middle of combat, for example. Say, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to interact somehow with this. And again, thinking in Cthulhu terms, it's a bit like interacting with one of your connections or one of your uh, background elements. It's a way for you to get rid of a condition on your sheet. So you can do that once for one single condition. So then, therefore, you remove the minus penalties that you get for, for that one particular one. Now, also during the game, you might find in that preparation phase that you want a particular piece of equipment. You think, well, we're going into a particularly cold waste. I want to have plenty of... Well, fuel to make fires with or wood to make fires with, for example. 
before game, we, uh, we'll get this out of the way now rather than do it uh, in the middle of game and clog it up with dice rolls. You have a resources rating on your sheet. Everyone gets to roll that amount of dice at this point and then tell me um, individually how many successes you get, how many sixes you get. I have one resource, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the vagabond is not renowned for having lots of money. <laughs> I'm, I'm burning my uh, burning my luck early. I rolled three dice and got two sixes. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. None what me. am I? What am I looking for when I roll? Uh, you're looking just for sixes. So generally, the other numbers don't count really during play. They'll count for certain that's, tables. That's what are we rolling? Sorry, Matt. That's uh, number of dice equal to your resources. Okay. Uh, two, <laughs> two, okay. Nothing. Nothing for the dock. Nothing for the servant. And nothing for the vagabond. Nothing. There we are. Right. So you have two from the uh, two from the hunter and two from the priest. You have collectively four points of resources that you can cash in, and if there's pat if particular pieces of equipment that you want you can go and get them from the equipment list and the availability rating is how many points that's going to cost. So uh, uh, those are in the upgrades section? Uh, they'll be on right? the reference PDF that I sent across as a separate doc. It's equipment, not the upgrades. It's equipment, all right, yeah. right. So it looks like... But it's nice. four spread across all of us. Like if Tom spends one, then we all collectively have three more to spend, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. You, you put it in a pot and it's then down to you as the, as the group to decide, well, what do we want between us? And then right. also who gets the item or items that you wish to purchase. Got we it. also, we have our, our starting equipment too, though, the, like our memento right. and whatever else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because certain archetypes get things like weaponry, for example, they have that equipment to begin with. But others, there you go. <laughs> um, but others <laughs> don't necessarily oh get weaponry as starting, <laughs> so they might have to buy it with resources. So we should probably have between us at least one source of light, right? So mm -hmm. choosing a hurricane lamp, that's yeah. two, though. Yeah. Nice. Well, you don't necessarily have to choose that now. Uh, this because you might find that there is certain piece of equipment that you think this is more relevant to what I know I'm going to need to do later in the scenario once you know what's going on. So we can sort of equip ourselves retroactively uh, as long as we agree? So, not so much retroactively, but once generally what happens is that uh, the scenario has a particular, the, the investigation has something that kicks it off. Oh, uh, normally it'd be something like and then uh, a letter turns up at the castle saying, please come help my village, blah, blah, blah. And it gives you certain details about what's going on. You would then think, well, this is the situation. What equipment do I think I will need? And then go out and buy stuff. Mm. So it's not something you have to do from the start. You, you get an idea of what's going on first. So oh, Mr. Erickson, uh, Oscar Erickson, I, I happen to yeah. have, I, I have a, I have a lantern. Mm -hmm. ah. Are we really going to? You don't have uh, to go to the lantern store. <laughs> no, we're not. I am definitely not going to attempt that. <laughs> they, they, they always end up like a hate crime. So they are all going to sound like me. Jump in, Yemeni. So, okay. So when I'm looking at something like the chapel, Mm -hmm. It says cost six. Does that mean six resources? That would, um, the cost is mainly because I've copied it straight out of the uh, the book. That would be a development point cost. Okay. Uh, in in so scenarios. DP so and XP, you, right? Uh, that, that would be development points. Because the, when, you, when you undertake investigations in the game, individually, you can get experience which there's basically a long list of, well, not long, it's, it's a list of questions that you answer. Things like, did I take part in the game? Did I uh, learn something new? Was this a new basin that we encountered? Uh, did we perform extraordinary actions to save people? That, that kind of thing. And for each, uh, each question that you as an individual PC can answer yes to, you get an experience. When you get five of them, you can cash them in and either increase a skill or buy a new talent. 
uh, but also collectively as a group, if you answer a different list of questions, you get development points which you can use to enhance the castle. Now, in the in the fiction, Castle Gillencrutz has been derelict for about the last ten years after the the fall or dissolution of the society. You, as the new group that have come in here, starting to uh, basically resurrect the society and take on the mantle of trying to uh, do the fight against the Vason. Uh, you are exploring the castle piece by piece in little sections that when it's safe to do so. The place is dilapidated, so various bits of it are not safe to go into. But between sessions, you might be brave enough, aka cash in certain development points, and discover things like the chapel that you hadn't previously found, uh, found before. But it costs, in that sense, the cost is the number of de development points out of your pool that you would need to spend to be able to get access to it. Certain ones also have prerequisites, but for the, for the sake of this, I've tried to pull up ones that only have prerequisites of things like have a particular archetype in the group rather than relying to someone else to have to buy a certain thing before you can then get something else. Because it's like a tree diagram. It goes off in lots of different directions. So with, with that in mind, are there any other people having a look at their sheet and having a look at the available talents? Are there any other mechanical terms that you have seen that you want explaining. I don't know if I missed this or not, but I've played other year zero um, games. So mm -hmm. is it for every condition you get a minus one to your dice pool? I, I've seen that mechanic in other ones. Okay. Yeah, Just correct. Making sure I had that right. Okay. Yeah, they, they stack. Yes. And then when you're broken, is it you can't take any action at all? That's a that's a feature in a different year zero game. Yeah. So I want to make you're, sure it was you're generally in cap or otherwise gibbering in a corner, depending on whether right. it's physical or mental. Um, but there's also a permanent or critical injury table, which you roll on to see how messed up you are as a result. Gotcha. If, if you get a lucky roll, you might not be messed up. You might actually get an insight, which is almost mm -hmm. a, almost like a superhuman quality in addition to having the sight whereby you can see basin. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it can actually be beneficial. Never for me. Because <laughs> my dice don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. So going back to the doc, we've got the emergency medicine talent. So you're ignoring yes. mental conditions when using medicine. Correct. Medicine is generally more of a long term use ability that it requires like a day of healing to take place in a controlled environment like a hospital wing, et cetera, or private uh, private wing. But the exception to that is when someone hits broken, you can go in and do emergency medicine or like emergency first aid. So up until that point, it's a case of, no, you've got to stay in bed. But the minute you get to death's door, it's now I can actually help you a bit quicker. Gotcha. And next up alphabetically, we've got the hunter. So you start with marksman. And what are the, the other five? Which one would you like? A bloodhound. Oh, okay. So plus two to vigilance when tracking your prey. All right. Next up, we've got the priest. So you start with blessing. And which other one would you like? And that's there's there's like five listed here. Yeah, there's two specific to the priest archetype, and then right. three which in theory anyone can get. Well, not not completely understanding the mechanics of the game, it does sound like absolution might be good. A player character who confesses to you as an act as an activity heals three conditions instead of two. That's a good yeah. One, yeah. Yeah. So getting rid of multiple conditions at one time yeah. never a bad thing. Okay. And next up, the servant. So you've got tough as nails as your starting mm -hmm. talent. Which other one would you like? Um, let's see. So and and again, I get to choose between the archetype specific talents and the general talents. Correct. Yep. That's right. Okay, oh, this is all, so many of these are just ones per session. I'm guessing session is, is the duration of, of the game. Yeah. So let's see, I'm going to go for something longer. Okay, here we go. This will come in handy. Brave, gain plus one to all fear tests. Mm. Very good one. That, that's plus one to the die or that's plus one uh, a die to roll? 
wh whenever it says plus on something, it's an extra dice uh, number of dice equal to the number. Got it. Okay. So, yeah, cool. so you'd for your fear tests, you would normally roll either your logic or empathy. You get to add plus one dice to that pool. Nice. Yeah, and the vagabond. So you start with suspicious. Nothing ominous about that at all. Not at all. Uh, and uh, that gives me the opportunity to ignore mental conditions when making vigilance tests. When does one make a vigilance test? Right, vigilance the circumstances. A, vigilance is a skill. So that would be just all right. again. I've got a one the, plus my logic. Yep. Yeah, so that's the fourth fourth skill up from the bottom of the list for everyone else. Vigilance is a bit like a spot hidden role. It's, okay. for, it's for a general awareness of when knowing when stuff is about to go down. Wow. Yeah, I am suspicious. Uh, I chose the right, <laughs> chose the right archetype. Um, I think that the, I should choose the general talent defensive. Okay, so each turn you get one extra action that may only be used to dodge or parry. So I'm hard to hit. Gotcha. Now, to explain how, again, that bit of the mechanic, in combat... Uh, combat works a bit differently than regular, just like roll initiative. We have a series of cards to determine initiative. Uh, what I'll do for, for this being online, if it was in person, I'd just lay down, uh, get you to pull out a card from the deck and put it in front of you. For this, I'm going to shuffle it and then I'm going to lay out cards, a bit like what we do with when we play Deadlands. So I'll lay them out in uh, order of where people are on my screen so I can keep track of who's on what number. These cards can move between players. So at the beginning of a, um, a round of combat, before anyone's acted, you can talk amongst yourselves and swap cards with another player. So, for instance, the doctor might want to swap cards with the vagabond. The servant might want to swap card their card with the priest. Just as long as you're within, in the fiction terms, a talking range, so you are actually in the same scene and the same location, you can coordinate who goes when and goes in what order in terms of resolving the initiative order low is good so it starts at one and then goes up to ten it's not a count down it's a count up and also cards go to your opponents as well they're also for certain abilities that if you get extra successes on your skill rolls there are certain effects which can mean things like you steal cards from your opponent if you get more successes than them in combat if you're going up against an NPC, for example. Um, and also then there's things like dealing extra damage if you get more successes, but there's a whole list of options which rather than go through them all now and bombard you with a lot of info on top of what you've already got, um, I'll go through those options as and when you meet the criteria so you've got the list of what you can do then. There thing, there's also things like giving other people successes as well in certain, certain criteria. So what, how do the um, Vessen get, where do they fall into that? Do they have an, a natural number that comes with their type or? No, uh, same thing. I draw from the same deck. Um, mm. There's basically number, there's cards between one and 10. And generally you won't be fighting more than, well, it's almost impossible to, fi uh, to fight more than 10 individual participants in a combat. Um, if it did end up having to, share cards because you've got that many PCs and that many enemies, groups can act on one particular number as well. Now, why, why I went into this whole thing to begin with is because of your defensive thing. Each active participant in a combat, unless otherwise specified, like by your defensive talent, has two actions that they can perform, a fast action and a slow action. The, again, the reference sheet that I sent across gives you examples of what a fast action is and what a slow action is. Uh, a slow action is something like make an attack it's or make a particular skill roll. The kind of things that you would think would normally be an action in combat. Fast actions are things like trying to dodge, trying to parry, etc., or move as well. You don't necessarily have to spend them on your turn. You can use your fast action to say, I'm going to try and dodge an incoming attack that comes towards me before it's my turn in combat. But if you've done that and then someone else attacks you later and you haven't got any fast actions left, you can't dodge. You've already had your one attempt at dodging. 
but the vagabond has the opportunity of being defensive and having a second. Yeah, you get, you get an extra fast action, so you get two chances to say either dodge or parry. But say one of that that extra one you get can only be used for that. Mm-hmm. Right, and I think that's everybody's additional talent selected. So going back to the the top of the alphabetical order, castle upgrades. So which of the, everyone's got three that they can look uh, that they can choose from. This is on on top of the normal ones that every group starts with, that you have the library and you have your uh, your manservant, Algot Frisk. So of the ones that the Doctor has, which one would you like? Oh, you're, you're uh, <laughs> muted. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot I muted myself. It wasn't Stop. like this time. <laughs> I'll take the infirmary being the Doctor. That feels fitting. Good one. So I've been able to push recovery rolls. This is uh, what I mentioned about having uh, permanent or critical injuries. You wait in recovery rolls to see if they're going to be permanent or not. So that is a good one to choose. And that's all characters, right? Not just me. Yeah, any, anyone yeah. that gets a critical, gotcha. uh, suffers a critical, um, critical injury, you can take them to the infirmary. They make the recovery roll as normal, but you then get the option to push it. So push you get it, yeah. the chance to, as you take a condition and then try and help them. Gotcha. Yeah. Or rather them being able to take the condition and be able to push it. Next one, the hunter, which of the talent, uh, which of the upgrades would you like? The kennel. Ah, so you got some dogs. There we go. highlighting these on my sheet so I've got a reference of which ones people are taking as soon as my machine responds anyway. right. next up the priest which one would you like hmm. well I think I'll go for the chapel mm-hmm. um, right. you, you got both sides of the recovery role then covered <laughs> Right. So the uh, the infirmary covers the uh, physical conditions. You're going the mental ones. Right. And also place with the... Um, you can potentially get holy water as well. That's right. Yeah, holy water. Mm-hmm. Plus it says they can push all mental recovery rolls. Yeah, so it's, it's the, the same kind of thing as the infirmary, but for mental conditions rather than... Or mentally broken rather than physically broken. The alternative, uh, gardening, gardener, somebody to oh, take care of the garden. One. It does It does say that all the food is nutritious and uh, you can also make poisons. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I think I'll go for the chapel for now. Let's make sure our mental and physical states are... All right. And uh, next up, the servant. Okay. I'm eyeing the gymnasium or the workshop. The workshop, it looks like it only helps one player, though. Yeah, it does. Whereas the gyna- gymnasium helps anybody who spends some time there can heal a physical condition. That sounds like it's very helpful. Its cost is more expensive, though. How? What is that cost coming off of again? Uh, for the purpose of this, don't worry. It's development point costs that you would normally you accumulate them between scenarios or between investigations, and then you cash them in for these upgrades later. But for this, because it's a just representing the fact you have had previous missions, don't worry about the cost. Okay, so I'm going to pick the gymnasium for everyone. Okay. So, and again, right. that's. That's so that everyone can uh, play a character who spends one scene in the gymnasium heals a physical condition. Go for a workout, suddenly get healed. I have a feeling we're going to have a lot of physical and mental conditions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think so. Uh, I'm, uh, saying, I'm saying nothing. Right. Now, as, as appealing as choosing a local tavern is, in part because we get to name it, mm-hmm. uh, given that we have two physical recovery spaces i'm going to go with parallel to the garden the chef so we have an efficient housekeeper with a passion for large portions as a vagabond that's probably especially attractive to me um so yeah fancy dinners at the headquarters and provisions 
without having to roll for them for going out into the world. So we have better than hard tech. I should have mentioned what the, what the kennel does. <laughs> Okay. It's the kennel. Uh, it's an enclosure for breeding and training dogs. The asset being during the preparation phase, this is where you uh, potentially can assign your advantage. So that one, that one time plus two bonus. Um, each level allows the player characters to bring a guard, bring a guard dog or hunting dog without using resources. So you don't need to spend points to get a nice little doggy. And those doggies, as per your equipment list, are pretty good. Yeah, so that I know I have a dog. I believe Erickson mm -hmm. has a dog, but this will give us another dog without, mm -hmm. oh, without oh, the money. I think I think Erickson's dog is a pet dog, which seems to be a little bit different than a hunting dog. Does the kennel give you a hunting dog? Yes. Yep. Okay. It gives you a hunting dog or a guard dog. Interesting. I have yeah, a hunting dog choice. and they are incredible. <laughs> I see that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, what does a pet dog do that is so different? I think it has, from memory, it's on your sheet as being what if it gives you close a combat bonus. plus yeah. one in close combat. Okay. okay, so she protects me and doesn't track or something. Yeah, they all the different dogs have slightly different advantages. They have different uh, bonuses they give in different circumstances. But yeah, they're, they're usually pretty good. Um, and uh, I just learned the Swedish pronunciation of my dog's name, Kulda. Oh, yeah. So again, again with the I am probably going to butcher pronunciation as well as uh, as well as trying to avoid any offensive accents. So just because we have a Swedish chef doesn't mean you shouldn't be impersonating the Swedish chef. <laughs> <laughs> Must resist. <laughs> it's a total That's... language, though. So mm -hmm. um, it's like I've mentioned before: the Johanna Lund Hog School. In Sweden, it's actually pronounced Johanna Lund School. <laughs> and if you don't say it that way, they don't understand what you say. Because it's a tonal language, like Chinese. And by the way, it's been probably a month or so since the Muppet Tarot deck came up on the Discord. But it is, <laughs> it is now eight cards, and, the sh and it's the Swedish death. Oh. Oh. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Drawing, oh. I, I never drew a Muppet horse before. It's fun. Oh, I want that to be a physical deck. That is so fun. <laughs> right. Um, I think the only other thing maybe that might be just good to reiterate uh, for, again, a structure of normal characters as well, is a little bit about the background of the setting. Right? Each of the pre-gens you've got has a personalized background. But to put it in context of like, the wider game, that uh, your group has come together as a result of realizing that you all individually have the sight, um, so that you are you're also what's referred to as Thursday's children, as per one of the old nursery rhymes, that you are people that have undergone trauma that has allowed you to see Vaisen. Uh, Vaisen are say, creatures from folklore in Scandinavian mythology that have generally always existed alongside humanity. But within the last, well, people, aren't, people debate on how long it's been, but within the last maybe 100 years or less, that there's been a change in how that interaction occurs with humanity. Um, used to be previously that there was more of a harmony between the supernatural and the world of man. Now they're very much at odds. I mean, Sweden at this point in time in the 19th century is... A rapidly changing place. This is the time of industrialization, the uh, kind of the foundations of the modern world, and a move away from the old ways. This is the rise of science over religion, etc. That it's very much a time of conflict and change and tumult. <coughs> that you've all had brushes or encounters with Basin, as to say, detailed in your backgrounds, and after maybe trial and error that you've eventually found references to this organization referred to as the society. Uh, the long-winded, uh, more grandiose title that was given to it in the, in the past uh, was the Society for the Studies of the Invisibles and Protection of Mankind. A uh, wonderful kind of just rolls off the tongue title that uh, various people shortened to the society. 
Um, the society was spread all across Scandinavia. It wasn't just based in Sweden. It wasn't just based in Uppsala, where you have found yourselves. But it had little chapter houses all over the place. And the one that you have come to find, uh, Castle Gillenkreutz, is in uh, Uppsala, northern, northern part of Uppsala, which has historically been Sweden's second city. Um, it's very much a seat of learning. It's a seat of academia. And there's various other key institutions in the city as well. It's got its own cathedral. There's, there's various bits and pieces that uh, you'll find here. But physically, it isn't a particularly big place, but it's more, it's more prestigious than large. And from here, your characters have arrived and met up with a lovely uh, lady who generally prefers to uh, remain in the insane asylum these days. Uh, Linnea Effelklint, who has provided you with the keys and deeds to Castle Gillenkrutz as a former member of the society. Well, 10 years ago, something happened and the society just disappeared. But that is somewhat shrouded in mystery. And in fact, the, well, the deeper history of the society also remains somewhat shrouded in mystery. But your group have come together to try and pick up the mantle and either take the fight back against the Vason or try to put right the wrongs, almost in a quantum leap kind of fashion there, I think, um, of what's caused the Vason and humanity balance to be upset. Because not all Vason, you have to go in there and smash them over the heads and beat them around, because generally they're, they're almost like spirits in a lot of cases. Physical violence isn't going to be the way you solve cases. Vason have a particular way to deal with them, like a, like a ritual that could be used to banish them or be used to drive them away. Violence is very rarely your friend, but violence still works against people and people can still be a big part of the problem because something usually has happened or been uh, brought about by human intervention that has caused a problem to come to the surface with a basin. So it's all about investigating the situation, finding what's, uh, what's kind of upset the apple cart, identifying which basin it is that's active in the problem and finding the ritual that can be used to put that problem to bed. So violence, never, never a guaranteed solution. Um, you've got a vast library in, this, in the castle, which details a lot of exploits of previous, um, previous investigations. So that's always a good resource to dive into and do some research there. Also, people know about Basin they've encountered previously, so you'll have your own knowledge you can draw upon. But yeah, that's the, the general, general aim of the society is to protect humanity from problems as they arise from the basin. Can and we do a quick rundown of what the skills are applicable to? Yes. All right. Let me uh, also do the stats as well as to what they relate to. So physique, um, you'll see that each attribute has three skills tied to it and it's kind of relevant to what the attribute does in this case. So physique is kind of general brawn and as it says physical activities, excluding things like agility, which is what <coughs> precision covers. So agility is like athletics. Uh, close combat is weaponry com close combat, not unarmed combat. Force is where your unarmed combat comes in, but also things like raw acts of strength, so things like pushing open, um, like bench pressing or forcing open doors, that, that kind of thing, so brute force and ignorance. Uh, medicine is pretty much as it says on the tin, it's for using uh, to heal physical conditions. Range combat is, again, as it says, anything that is a combat um, attack which is done at range, so uh, guns, crossbows, slingshots, that kind of thing. Uh, stealth, pretty obvious. Investigation is you know, a kind of combination of hmm, kind of research, crime scene investigation, or oh, not the research, that's learning. Um, things like crime scene investigation is probably the best example. It's going into a scene, searching it, finding clues that are there. Uh, learning is kind of like a no role in Cthulhu terms. It's what, what you've got up here, but also can be research like library use and so on. Uh, vigilance, already said things like spot hidden awareness. Hey, don't don't try and uh, sneak attack me from behind, nasty monster. 
inspiration is the equivalent of first aid or equivalent of medicine but it's for mental conditions so this is the the role that you'd make if you want to try and like a psych role that you would try to calm someone down and take away the med, uh, their mental conditions from them manipulation is getting people to do what you want them to do and Oh, and inspiration also is things like you can uh, like rile up, well, not rile up, you can inspire crowds and generally uh, like work a crowd doing public speaking. But manipulation is more like, hey, I want you to do something and I'm going to say the right things that make you do what I want you to do. Observation is a bit like a psych role. It's like a lie detector. So it's where you can, uh, where you can see what's, uh, what's going on in a person's head rather than necessarily what the words are saying. And then what do we do with the little experience thing underneath that? If we succeed, we click one? Uh, that would be normally at the end of a session, if you're playing a series of ongoing wow. games. Um, I would present you with the list of questions that I mentioned earlier. And for everyone that you say yes to, you get to tick one of those boxes. And then yes. when you hit five, you cash them in for advancement. Okay. But yeah, it's only, only, only in an ongoing game do you need to worry about those. Are we about ready then? Yeah, I think that pretty much covers all the bases. Greetings, fellow investigators, and welcome to our video podcast, Into the Darkness, where tonight my friends and I will be playing the Vason role-playing game. I'm your host, Tom Rayleigh. The scenario is called Firebreak. It was written by Matthew Sanderson, who is also our game master. And this is a one-shot. So without any further delay, let's, con let's begin our journey into the darkness. Matthew? Right, thank you very much, Tom. So well, it is the latter part of the 19th century in Uppsala, Sweden. And on the northern side of town, we have Castle Gullenkrutz, this somewhat run down up until fairly recently was uh, thought to be abandoned, derelict building, which has now become the home to the newest iteration of the society, as it's called. Uh, five lovely members that surround us on the screen here. It's about the look of midway through autumn. Uh, hot summer days and evenings are a bit of a fading memory by this point. The skies are grey and overcast. There's plenty of wind and rain. And given the castle is dilapidated, that means that there's pretty much the sound of constant dripping water in uh, various parts as there are holes in the roof, uh, weak walls, and yeah, it's uh, not the best of weather, to say the least. And we start on a grey, wet Saturday morning, very early in the morning, in fact, uh, just after dawn. And you are all, I say not living per se, but you're definitely based in the castle because you never know when there's going to be a request for the society's help come in. So you have rooms at the castle where there are various areas that have been renovated over the course of the last few months that have been made more habitable. Probably the, uh, those of you that are the unluckiest amongst the bunch probably still have a hole in the roof that you're trying to uh, patch up. But hey, not everyone. You have a manservant, uh, Algot, who pretty much turned up when he, re uh, when he realized that you as a group had come together to form this new iteration of the society and offered his services. And he is a, a grumpy butler that's uh, very much overworked and you're fairly sure he's not paid. Uh, do we want to pause if we've lost him? Oh, no, he's back. No. See, you're fairly sure he's not paid and that may explain why he's, uh, why he's so grumpy. And we begin with a knock on each of your doors by the aforementioned Algot, uh, requesting your presence as something has apparently taken place down in the, the entrance hall that he thinks you would probably uh, want to have a look at. Thank you, Algot. Yeah, uh, thank you, be right down. Uh, danger or not? Um, he pauses in that kind of, um, I think the uh, danger has passed for the individual in question. 
but maybe not for the rest of us. Fair enough. Male or female? Pretty sure he's male. But yes, uh, I'd uh, I'd advise probably uh, we we get this out of the way, sirs and madams, uh, before having uh, before breakfast is uh, is served. We don't want you to uh, to bring it back up again. And he leads you to the entrance uh, the entrance lobby, and it becomes quite apparent quickly as to what he's referring to that on the inside of the two large oak double doors uh, that act as the main entrance to uh, the castle. There's something being written on the door, across the door in blood, uh, the blood of which has come from the severed head of what looks to be a teenage boy who is lay, uh, just the head is laying on the stone floor in front of the door, in front of the double doors, with a look of surprise and terror still etched onto its very dead face. And the message that's written on the door is thus. Where is Jonah? Johan, I think. Johan. Johan. You have until sundown. Johan. I don't I don't know a Johan. Do any of you know a Johan? Well, we're Swedish. We probably know 50 of them. <laughs> it, it is a rather common name. Oh. So does the, the lad look familiar at all? Nope, you none of you recognize him. This poor kid. Well, I wonder what the uh, the rest of his body is. Uh, Gustav. I'll call my, my dog over. Goes, uh, comes over wagging its wagging its tail. Uh, I want Gustav to to smell the head. I want to try to follow the scent to see where where because this is just a head. Mm-hmm. Where's the torso? Where's, the blood. where's the rest it's raining of the outside? Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, you can give me for tracking tracking the scent. You can give me a vigilance roll. Vigilance. Running at plus three because of the dog. Does Bloodhound help me out here or no? Check on the stats of Bloodhound. Because it says plus two vigilance when tracking your prey. This isn't really prey. But um, does it, is it just like flavorful when it says prey? <laughs> I, I, I think it's flavorful because it is still tracking and it's okay. something that you are trying to find. So we'll, we'll give you the benefit. Nine That's dice. One. Mm-hmm. That is two sixes. Okay. Right. So even with the with the rain, it doesn't seem to be putting, uh, putting the little yapper off. Um, he does go straight towards the door. Uh, he's kind of anxiously bouncing around, waiting for someone to open the door. All right, I'll, I'll open it. Okay. And as you open it, there's a lady stood on the other side who was just about to knock, who suddenly is taken aback by the fact that the door opens immediately in front of her. And behind her, uh, probably about six inches taller than her, uh, is a man that's in rather distinctive uniform, uh, lots of blue and gold of the local constabulary. So he has a, a sword down by his side as part of their normal normal attire. Um, she sort of steps back slightly. Oh, uh, you must have heard us coming. And she reaches into her long coat and pulls out uh, a small leather fold, uh, leather document pouch, and holds it up. Um, Detective, I've completely forgotten her name. A uh, detective Carell from the from the Uppsala police police station. I was coming here to ask a few questions, as it seems like there's been a, an incident on your on your property. Yes, uh, maybe, uh, yes, come in, come in. Yeah, this is maybe coming out of the rain. Of we just became aware of it. Uh, <laughs> Matt, does does the dog want to keep going? Is he tracking a scent somewhere outside? Okay, I want. Yeah. I just like go inside. I want to keep following my dog. Okay, and and, and one other point of clarification: the mm-hmm. the blood message was on the interior of the door, not the exterior. So, yep. so inside. somebody inside did that. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. She steps in along uh, along with the constable that she brings in uh, behind her. 
and sort of shakes herself down and then sees the head on the floor. Ah, well, that's where that got to then. We found the rest of him, but missing that bit, that makes her... Um, uh, she pauses as she turns and sees the, uh, the message on the door. Ah. Huh. Johan. Uh, any, yeah, anyone have any idea who this who Johan is? We don't know the last name, so we don't have any clue as to... We're afraid not. We're one of a hundred people. Well, um, should we get somewhere to sit down? Somewhere, somewhere comfortable. This this may take a few minutes to uh, explain what's what's Please happening. Come inside. Yes, yes I'll uh, inside I'll arrange for some down. coffee to go yes. on. Yeah. As you retire to a, a nice little sitting room where you've got some only partially moth-eaten chairs and uh, sofas and settees set up. Um, Torren is heading outside following uh, the little dog yapping through the puddles, uh, follows the path straight out to the to the road. You've got the castle, if you think of it as being in a rectangular plot of land. It's slightly pulled back from the your southern edge of that. Um, you've got a gravel path that leads through the slightly overgrown gardens at the front. The gardens at the rear are much larger. Uh, you've got a few features back there that you're aware of. There's uh, like a nice little fountain. There's what you think might be the remains of a greenhouse back there, but it's go overgrown by weeds. If you had a gardener, you'd be able to uh, start uncovering some some bits back there, but that's, uh, that's later down the line to employ someone to do that. You've also got a mound out the back that probably uh, probably no one goes near because it's when you've got close enough, you realise there are a series of headstones just dotted along the top of it. So I think, mm, yeah, not going to go there anytime soon. And little pond and other other features. But yeah, little, little loggy goes down the gravel path out towards the opening in this otherwise large eight foot tall wrought iron fence that surrounds the property. And then starts walking along, turning right, walking along the fence and when you go around the corner and start working down the long edge of the ground, um, the outskirts of the grounds, you can see another couple of officers in blue and gold trying to lift up what looks to be, from dis from a distance, it looks like something that's stuck on the top of the fence. Uh, the top of the fence. As you get close enough to them, you can see they are trying to dislodge the impaled body of a teenager, or at least. The body minus the head of a teenager that's been impaled on the top of the spikes on top of the fence as they're trying to lift it off you can see these two rather inept officers are ending up pulling the body almost using the spiked tops of the fence like a saw and end up tearing the body in two as they finally pull it down onto the ground there's a splat of viscera there's entrails hanging from the fence and still two uh, two legs which are now dangling on the other side and your cute little doggy just goes up to uh, goes up to the body with a somewhat content wagging of the tail looking back at you as if uh, as if to say i found it uh, good good boy do stuff i'll give him like a little treat or something out of my coat pocket yeah we'll quite happily lap that up and morning officers yeah. I say, as it's this early in the morning, it's just you and the other officers out and about. There's no one else out in the rain at this point. They they turn to you as you as you introduce. Oh, uh, he hello there. Uh, well, we'd request this is a, an active crime scene, uh, as you can probably tell, or some kind of accident. Uh, do you, do you live in the live in the castle? I I do. I'm one of the residents. Oh. Okay, I believe one of the detectives is headed in. Uh, is going to be heading inside to, to ask some questions. Yeah, I've already. Uh, I I saw her and uh, the other uh, constable who was with her uh, go inside. Already passed them. Ah, okay. You probably probably want to head in uh, head in then uh, head in miss to make sure that we have uh, we don't want any we don't want any missing part of the investigation. I know Detective Carell can be a kind of a, a stickler for these these kind of things. Yes, yes, of course, but uh, please, if you could just do me one small favor and try not to mangle the poor boy's body too bad. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they, they look between themselves. 
uh, almost as if kind of uh, saying, "Well, you did you did worse than I did." And uh, again, well, while I'm while I'm out, I mean, this is a very tall fence, isn't it? Eight foot tall. Yeah. So somebody's like somebody, something has come and. Mm-hmm. Are there tracks out here? Are there like heavy footsteps in the mud? Like, in give the me an investigation room? roll. Uh, investigation is not my strong suit. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got the dog. That is a six and a whole lot of ones. <laughs> Thankfully, ones don't do anything, so don't worry <laughs> about them. Four, four ones, one six. <laughs> Right. You have a look at the corpse. You have a look at the the fence and then the other side of the fence. You do notice a few things that even though the body's been ripped in half and still bits of it are still hanging from the from the fence, you can see on almost like the shoulder blades on the back. There are a series of long, deep cuts that for someone as yourself who's been out in the wilderness and knows what animal attacks look like. These look like claw marks. That something grabbed this kid from behind. And then looking on the other side of the fence, you can see the impressions in the mud of what looked to be two large feet. I mean, these are probably about a foot and a half to two foot long, implying this is quite some large creature. Probably grabbed the kid from behind, lifted him up, and then thrust him down onto the top of the fence. But you see that as well as that, there are two sets of what look to be human footprints running from the direction of the castle to the fence. One of them, the footprints seem to, um, looking at the feet that are dangling still from the fence, would equate to that person. But there's, there's another a, set that are smaller. Yeah. Uh, I think this is uh, Johan. Where did they go? Is he going back into the castle? Someone's running away from the castle and then to the fence. Okay, and two sets of foot, foot, footprints. So somebody's been killed and the other one's missing. All right, well, mm-hmm. I'll go back and join the others. Okay. And meanwhile, as coffee, uh, coffee arrives, uh, the chef that you've employed also brings out a tray of cookies and says that, yeah, I understand these, these go down well normally. So uh, normally an afternoon treat, but I've got uh, got a tray of cookies for everyone and some uh, nice hot coffee. And everything's quite nice and civilized. And that's about corresponds to get Torum back in about that, about that kind of same time frame elapses. And the detective stands to address the group so as a uh, quick uh, preface to what I would intend to do with uh, you fine folks here, she pulls out a notebook from her pocket. Um, there's been a an incident, as I said, that uh, a body was found on the outskirts of your property, uh, impaled on the railings. Oh, dear. Uh, yeah, we, we were alerted to this uh, about an hour ago um, when a young lady came into the police station, which is only a couple of blocks north of where you are, so it's pretty close. Uh, She was uh, distraught. She was claiming that uh, her and her uh, friend, maybe a uh, quite intimate friend, were walking down the, the edge of your property as they were there heading home after a late night and were attacked uh, admittedly, some aspects of what she was saying we're, we're counting as somewhat uh, fantastical and it, it being dark, she's obviously upset and we, we're waiting for her to calm down before we get a, a bit more of a, a rational story out of her. But see, on her insistence, we came to have a look and we did find a body. So there's obviously something has happened. So... Uh, We'd like to take statements from everyone here just to account for their whereabouts over the course of the last few hours. And we'd like to do that individually just to make sure that everyone's story matches up. That's fine. Um, Detective, could we ask 
What did the young woman say? I mean, you said fantastical, but hmm. would you mind if we asked what did she say? Sure. Um, she flicks through her notebook. So it's one of those where it's just page after page she flicks back, uh, holds it up. She describes a figure, um, a shadowy figure. So we're, we're imagining someone dressed in black um, that chased them along the fence and then grabbed her boyfriend, um, well, her, her male friend, uh, Per, his name is uh, Per Backland. Um, her name is uh, Sophia Orr. Do uh, either of these names mean anything to anyone? So not, not people that you know here. No, there's, there's a lot of bemused faces. So these, these are not names you're familiar with. Well, I would say this, uh, apparently Sophia is the young lady who came, came to us and reported the incident. But apparently this... this dark figure this assailant grabbed per and impaled impaled him on the fence and she was saying that this was someone that was about eight foot tall and was obviously much larger and uh sounded more monstrous she was describing it almost like some kind of monster but obviously that's uh that's just the hairy or, the moment. hairy or slick did she say hmm did she say it was wearing clothing, or was it hairy? Or oh, a a dark figure. I mean, before that's dawn, all she said. Dark yeah, figure. It was it was raining. It was dark. She just saw this tall figure, long arms. She said claws, but could be a knife. For all we know. Did we but, get a precise time on this? Well, she came into us running in about an hour ago, so we don't imagine that she uh, she stopped anywhere along the way that she ran all the way to the police station as it's fairly close to here. Uh, uh, Detective officer, if you don't mind, we were just informed of the intrusion before you arrived. Uh, I didn't really, I couldn't tell how the uh, young fellow's head was separated. Uh, do you mind? Uh, my friend here is a, is a medical doctor. If we had a look, since you're going to be interviewing people anyway, maybe the officer wants to come with and we can see. Sure. You can interview me first if you want. I didn't catch that. I said you could interview me first if you want. Ah, okay. We, we have a small chapel if you want to use that as a private place. Oh. It's quite quite quiet. Yeah, that, that, sounds, that sounds wonderful. All right, so in which case, she first of all leads... Uh, the doctor and the vagabond out to uh, the hallway. Says, so if you'd like to uh, have a look at the, we'll see the remains here, and any insight you can provide would be uh, would be much much welcomed. Uh, Constable Thurlin here will stay with you and just oversee to make sure that uh, everything's fine. We'll see. We don't want uh, we don't want any damage to the the evidence. But then, yes, I'll have a word with your uh, with the good father here in the in the chapel. I can also see private messages starting to fly already. <laughs> uh, right. In response to uh, Torrin's question, then, uh, you have one success. If you've got two, I would be able to give you the answer to that. So you oh, may have God to go back it. and have a look. All but right. all, the, <laughs> the garden is overgrown, so you saw the immediate footprints, but going out and trying okay. to trace where back and forth has happened will be another investigation. Okay. Well, that's, out there. All right. All right. So looking at the looking at the head, looking at what's left of it around the neck, you're fairly sure that this is a combination of brute force and what looks like claws. That one claw has you can see through the hairline there are various indentations where something has been forced through the skull to hold the head in place, grip through the bone and then almost tear the head off while another has then cut in the process. So, yeah, this is claws and brute force. This is not a surgical operation by any means. Uh, the, the detective's idea that a knife was involved seems fairly preposterous when you look at this. This Ooh, looks Chris. like something that a vicious bear might do or something smarter than a bear. 
ripped his head clean off. I don't, they must not have any medical training whatsoever. Oh, I can't imagine a bear doing something like this though. And that, that is atypical. Well, quite. Yeah. And in, in town, the, the writing smeared on the doors, is it clear that the neck was the implement? Yep. Yeah, as if someone was using it as an inkwell, dib, 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 and then wrote with fingers. Oh, with, okay. With fingers. Uh, oh, clawed or fingers. Claws. If you yeah. If you have a closer look at the scratches the on the door. paint is scratched yeah. under the blood. Yeah, so much smarter than a bear. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know any bears who can spell Johan. <laughs> yeah, li literate bears are not something I've ever come across. I... Finley wasn't a bear. Well, uh, more coffee and cookies for me. I think I'll go have a look at the rest of the boy. It, just uh, the doctor, uh, just, just so you know, the, uh, the boys out there have made a mess of it. Oh, of course. Very well. It was, well, when I first went out there, it was impaled on the top of a spike. It is now in half and in pieces on the grounds. Well, let's see what we can glean from it regardless. Oh, I'll go with. Does Why not? There, yeah. Does the blood on the door and the message, does that uh, seem to match the, the time frame? It's, it's really fresh for blood? Yeah, it's not it's not dried definitely not but it's definitely sticky still okay so it's matching up then. okay mm -hmm. okay as you head towards the door the uh, the constable very much uh, is keeping an eye on where you're going and say if you don't mind i'll uh, i'll accompany you because i need to keep an eye on all our uh, folks to interview of course yeah. perfectly understood mm -hmm. so, sorry three are of you, you hitting up oh, go on. I was going to ask uh, if if Soren's interview isn't um, is it coming up because Oscar and the doctor are going to go look at the body, but mm -hmm. I noticed some footprints that were whoever it was, uh, the boy who was killed and mm -hmm. uh, the the lady who was with them. They were on our grounds, and they were running away from the castle. I'm having difficulty uh, determining where exactly they were running from in the castle. If you could help me look. Uh, oh, great maybe language. rather than... Oh, okay. Or any of you. If, I mean, if you want to. I, I couldn't. I was a... Uh, I, found, I found the larger set of, of footprints and the size of what killed the boy. I'm, <laughs> having, I'm having a difficult time uh, finding where exactly they were. Uh, okay. If you say this before we leave, maybe yeah. the officer would like to accompany us through the castle to the yard to look on the inside since you've looked on the outside. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. They, they certainly weren't our guests. We, none of us knew of them uh, coming here. Mm. So it's almost like they were uh, either unexpected guests or trespassing. In fact, the uh, the constable, you can see him kind of nodding away to himself. You can almost see the cogs turning in his otherwise fairly empty head. And he says, well, that doesn't match what the uh, what the girl said. She said they were walking outside the property. Yeah, that's, yeah. and I, I'll, I mean, go outside, I'll show him the footprints. It's like all the footprints are on the inside of the property line, inside the fence. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I think I'd like to, we'd like, should should have a look at this and make make some notes. And meanwhile, inside, uh, rather than play through each of these scenes, because what she will intend to do is the detective will want to take you aside and ask you the same series of questions. Mm -hmm. um, basically, things like, where were you an hour ago, which pretty much everyone is going to say asleep. So I'm it's saying my be a, prayers, yes. Yeah, so a st fairly standard response for everyone there. But she is going to ask a few questions that... Uh, we'll get a quick overview from everyone in turn as to what you what you tell her. Um, she's going to ask about what what's actually happening in the castle. That she thought this place was deserted. That it's been like vacant for about ten years or so. So is, is it just the five of you that are here, or have you got members of staff beyond the uh, beyond the butler and the and the chef that she's seen already? It's just us. We're doing research on. Uh... Uh, Swedish folklore and uh, and such. 
Okay. Yeah, she, she'll ask a bit more, a few probing questions about uh, what kind of, uh, do you work for an academic body? Are you part of the university? Or it's uh, basically trying to get an idea of what's going on here, but without going into too much detail. So just that you study folklore. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I don't, should we just make something up? Well, that's, that's up to you. <laughs> uh, University of Sweden, <laughs> University of Uppsala. Yeah, I mean, the University of Uppsala is quite a prestigious uh, institution. So she's uh, she nods away at that. So oh, it's very, uh, very respectable work. Otherwise, yeah, she's just getting an idea of who's here, what what you folks do. That you're all asleep when the when the incident took place. No one seems to know any of the names that she's fired out so far. And progressively, you it, you're, yeah. you're all seeing it from an individual perspective. But as she's writing things down in a notebook, you can just see it. Not kind of getting disheartened, but a case of up, oh, same again, same again. Ah, see previous entry. Has Arrow this happened three. before? Does it seem? Uh, oh, I've uh, I've only been working with the with the police here for about a year. Um, I transferred up from uh, from Stockholm, and to be honest, this is this is a lot more violent than than what I've seen in the big the bigger city. This is uh, this is new for me. Well, I mean, um, we we have occasionally assisted in solving cases because of our expertise. If you'd like us to assist, um, we do know uh, sometimes unusual cases, whether they actually have to do, I mean, who believes in real monsters anyway, but hmm. sometimes the perpetrator believes in the monsters and does crimes that seem very much like we could tell you which I mean, which avenues along which lines they seem to be moving okay uh, you can give me an inspiration role can I play my violin while I film <laughs> <laughs> Let's go all, see. you go all Sherlock on her at the time here. now I had it a second ago okay <laughs> Inspiration is empathy and two. That gives me six. Mm -hmm. And not a single six. Okay. Well, she's not hostile to the to suggestion. She's she definitely nods to herself and thinking, yeah, I mean, it's if if we do need to bring in like civilian uh specialists, then I can definitely I've obviously got your details. I can uh, drop by and ask and present any information that comes up. So I'll, uh, I'll bear you in mind. Thank you. Yes, too. Yeah. All right. And so eventually she's going to call each of you in turn, but we'll then do the group that are going outside, accompanied by the, uh, by the constable. So on the inside of the fence, you are trudging around the, kind of the corner of the building of the castle, and you've got this long, got three, sometimes four stories in parts where it's got the various towers and extensions that come out. But otherwise, lots of lots of boarded up, lots of broken windows. This is from your exploits, having looked around the inside of the, the castle. You think, orientating yourself, thinking, well, the entrance is here, we're here. You think this is part of the castle that you haven't explored yet. Um, but as far as you're aware is probably some old residential rooms. There's nothing big as far as you're aware on this side. It's not like there's a huge hall or anything that you can see, but this looks like maybe what could have been smaller offices or research or maybe I say even residential wings that have uh, yet, to be, yet to be examined from the inside. Um, having a look around the very overgrown gardens, everyone can give me an investigation role to see if you can spot anything from here. Uh, 
I have a uh, one success. Mm -hmm. One mm. success. Zero. Okay. Uh, Torren's definitely looking around, thinking, well, I've seen footprints. They've got to be around here somewhere. And besides the initial scene of a scuffle on this side of the uh, this side of the fence where the guy was picked up and then slammed down on the on the fence you're not seeing anything more than that there's just thick heavy undergrowth that's covering virtually any sign of any tracks from here whereas oscar and uh dorothea start pulling back a little bit and heading more towards the the castle itself uh, you know between you you notice a couple of things there's a set of footprints that come in at a different angle from the fence to the castle wall. In fact, there are three sets of footprints that come in. Uh, one of them corresponds with the feet that are still dangling from the fence. The others are two smaller sets of footprints. So you think maybe one of them definitely male, what's left on what's left there. One of them could also potentially be male, but unsure. The other one almost certainly female because of the, uh, just the general size and weight of the weight distribution of the prints. They come in from the fence at an angle through the grounds and get to the castle wall. And then presumably some time passes. You can then see two sets of footprints going straight out away from the castle wall as if to take the fastest route out of the grounds as possible and whereas the first set of three prints are coming in fairly stealthily fairly you can see the footprints are fairly close together evidently implying that they are moving slowly when they're coming back they are running as fast as they can uh, there's long strides between them and a good few feet away from the wall there's these two large between one and a half two foot long prints that they they're almost v-shaped they have a very narrow heel but then much wider end of the foot where there are a series of what look to be claws that have then indented into the mud where this thing has dropped from a fairly great height and then just these two footprints appear and then it starts running and chasing after the other two footprints as they head towards the fence is there anything like shredded clothing or the like? Not here, but you would find the shredded uh, a shred of the clothing from the dead uh, the dead boy by the fence that correspond to that's where he was attacked. He was attacked as he tried to climb over the fence. And the two seemingly male sets of footprints, they're shod, right? There's not any barefoot parties. There's like a dainty or set of shoe bearing people and then two male-ish, male-seeming shoe-bearing people. Yeah, H human footprints are all booted or shoed, whereas the thing is evidently barefoot because you can find that there are the indentations of claw marks at the end of the footprint. And they're huge. Mm -hmm. And that as it dropped from a great height, your instinct, probably not instinctively, but definitely logically thinking, looking up, Oh. One of the windows that's on the second floor, you can see it's one of these bay windows. So it comes out and then it's got two sides and angle. You can see on the left hand side where it's angled, the window has been forced open. You can see there's what looks to be the mark of a crowbar or some kind of forcing implement that has forced it and broken it open. But then on the other side, you can just see curtains inside that are pulled shut so you can't see into the room itself. But on the other side of the window, so that you've got that window has been forced open, then you've got this one going down this side of the bay. Imagine as if someone had been playing golf and a golf ball had gone through the window. There's a hole about that big with radial cracks coming off it but it looks like a very old crack. It's a very old hole in the, um, in the glass. The, the forced open window is obviously much more recent, but yeah, the other one is really old. You can almost see moss growing in some of the cracks. I have a, I have a feeling that the, uh, this Johan is still inside. But the 
Well, right. So you think Johan was the third I, invader? I, I mean, I can see why they would. I, I see why they wouldn't want to talk about this. They broke it into our, into our. Uh, yeah. Is there any sign of any? Uh, I'm sorry. That the bay windows are how many stories up? It's one up from the ground floor. So, is there a, a trellis or lattice or something that a human could readily climb to that height? There's a drain pipe that goes up that uh, that goes up that angle where the otherwise the bay part of the window or the extension meets the flat part of the wall. So it is a relatively easy climb to get up there. Uh, Constable, uh, the young lady, Sophie, did you send her home or is she in custody or? I, I believe she's been sent. Uh, she's been sent home. We took a, we took a statement from her and then she was uh, she was allowed to go home. We said we'd be in touch if we needed to uh, to get any details from her. She uh, he kind of scratches his head. I think she said she uh, she lived in one of the apartments down by the train station. Did she leave anything at the at the police station? Um, well, other than the, the whole load of tears that she uh, she shed, um, no, you know, she didn't leave anything with us. No, it just made us came in. We'll see, fairly uh, fairly distraught. Um, also gave her statement. Uh, we calmed her down, and then uh, we had one of the constables escort her home. And he, uh, you know, like. Tissues or do you know? Do you have her exact address of the apartment, or just the vague idea of where she might be? Um, you can see those those cogs start turning in, start turning his head again. Uh, and he promptly he gives you an address. I'm fairly sure. Yeah, she said she was on the th third floor of the apartment building. Okay. Well, if it, if it's same to you, Constable, I'm going to get Gustav to reacquire. Um, the scent of uh, Buckland. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to find where that window is inside because they, they came in. So maybe the dog could pick up where they were walking around up there. Mm. Sound, sounds like a good idea to me. You, you ever thought about uh, taking up a, taking up a detective role? We, we, <laughs> we could do with some good folks with you that have got some, got some brains. No, no, no. I, I much prefer, uh, working with and tracking animals than I do people. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, well, well, if you change your mind, I'm sure they'd put in a good word for you. Uh, if we could put in a good word for you down at the police station. And yeah, he's quite happy to head back inside with you. What's what's Soren doing about this time? Um, so I'm assuming I've wrapped up with my interview. Yep. You'd probably be the next one that comes in. So as uh, as the father is led out back to the uh, back to the sitting room, she sees you're the only the person left at the moment. And says, "Well, um, yeah, I'll have a word with you next." Certainly. How do you elaborate on the same kind of questions? Um, well, we collaborated together uh, here within this castle to uh, perform uh, research into local and abroad folklore. We've been doing this for some time, and this was a great opportunity to take advantage of this. Also, uh, uh, working in conjunction with uh, the university, um, this has been uh, quite a blessing here to to have this facility available for use. But we're we're still we we're not familiar with too much of the property, just this immediate area. So. We are lo looking down the road to, to try to make this a bit nicer. This is quite shocking to see this, this event occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she probably at this point, as there's a sound of dripping into a bucket that's out in the hallway outside the chapel. So saying, oh, I presume you're, uh, are you doing some renovations as well then? Yeah, the place seems a bit run down in parts. Oh, yes. Yeah, it, it, it'll take quite a lot. Uh, Unfortunately, I think it might be a bit too much for our current budget, but so it's going to be slow work. Nothing too quick. I know, I know that feeling. The uh, she kind of almost uh, kind of lapses into more of an informal tone, saying, "Yeah, even down at the uh, police station, we've got our own uh, trouble with some of the uh, the lodgers, the uh, the rats oh, in yeah. various parts of that." 
So yeah, this this place is certainly better than some of ourselves. I'll put it that way. Yeah, shakes her head and otherwise then continues on jotting down notes from from the conversation. All right, uh, which point then leads you back out to join the, uh, join the father. This is when. Uh, is everyone else from outside coming inside or is anyone else wanting to do anything outside? I wanted to get a look at the boy's body personally. I, I'm assuming Torin shared what she observed, but I also want to look at it myself. So, mm-hmm. But after that, I'll be heading back into the castle. Gotcha. Yeah, the uh, the two fairly inept uh, constables are now, they've, they've kind of ripped down the remains of the legs, but realised they've then fallen on your side of the fence so they're kind of trying to reach through between the between the bars in the fence and then pulling it through the uh, through the gap as there's still intestines just like streamers for, uh, falling from the top of the fence uh they they've been joined by a small wagon which has pulled up which they've pulled a black bag off and they're more um, they're more pouring or dropping bits of the uh, the boy into the bag rather than laying him out with any kind of respect or decency. Um, and you said that this the body does have some of those claw marks, yes? Shoulder blades. So yeah, okay. was it was attacked from the back. Does this look... I know that I kind of have a story in my background about someone being attacked by something. Does this kind of match those claw marks too? Is this something I've seen before? This is... There's definitely bells are starting to ring for you, yes. Jesus. Okay. Very well. And they do, just just for my own edification, they do match the claw marks that we're seeing in the ground and the claw marks that we kind of noticed in the wood and the blood as well. Like those all match. It's more that the the ones in the mud are obviously the uh, claws on its feet, but you reckon the oh, ones okay. on the door would be its hands, and it's the hands that have definitely right. matched okay. Okay. on the body. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, yeah, with that, seeing, yes. yeah, you're definitely seeing similarities. Well, then I'll I'll go back into the mm-hmm. the castle, but I look very troubled now. Mm-hmm. Right. So, in which case, Oscar and Torren, and then a little bit later Dorothea come in uh, the detective comes between Torren and Oscar and says oh um, before you wander off who would like to join me next in the in the chapel uh, I'll go um, that, that's fine okay. but, yeah, Torin, so, yeah, you wanted leaves, to go explore so I'll go leaves, leaves the other two to then go and explore with the uh, with the constable who's following behind you. He's very much taking his lead from from you two. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask him just so he's not... Uh, uh, given that there's a probable intruder in our home, uh, if you don't mind if I grab my rifle, just, you know... Oh, you sure, know. sure. He, sudden, he suddenly just, gets a bit more alert and puts his, uh, puts his hand on the hilt of his sword. Yeah, it's just... just want to tell you before I go mm-hmm. <laughs> grabbing a weapon. Um, yeah, so rifle in tow and the uh, and Gustav, uh, following Gustav, uh, we're gonna go try to find the scent of these people who entered. Tor- Torin, wait, wait up if if you and the constable wouldn't mind, I would I would like to go with you just to well, the, the more the merrier. Uh, in numbers, if there's a lunatic about, does yeah, the other one come with us? You we, said there's somebody in the in the castle. We yes. might have a, a breaker in, yeah. Is yeah, it the three of them? Uh... The dead boy and the and the lion girl had a, a third friend with them, and a window's been jimmied in that. Oh, the you know this dark wing. Oh, I'm gonna you know bring my walking stick to test stairs and things as well as we try to find that window because it's pretty moldy over here. So, you get various bits of uh, the various bits of equipment you need, and then follow follow the doggy up the stairs. And in the atrium, you've then got a balcony which runs back over towards the front of the building. You follow that balcony round, and then there's a corridor which you remember having gone down at one point, which you're fairly sure goes down the front of the building and then turns away to that side of the building. And you start heading down there occasionally prodding ahead of you with the with the stick to make sure the floor isn't going to give way beneath you. Um, there's definitely some waterlogged sections of floor here. So the uh, 
The floorboards are a little spongy, but they're not breaking. So it's uh, definitely a few cautious steps in places, but you start to head further into the building. Yeah, you always always walk on the left side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, close, to, what, close to the wall. <laughs> about what time of day is it now or night? It's about seven in the morning. So seven it's o'clock. a little bit after dawn. So are there some streams of light coming through some of the windows in the passing rooms we're passing? Yeah, very, very gray, very dreary light with the sound of rain. Not quite hammering on the window, but definitely pattering. Oh, the outside. so I, I won't need to light my lovely hurricane lantern then. Well, not at the moment, but when you get around the corner, you think probably you do want to start lighting it up. So mm-hmm. I'll describe what's around the corner in just a moment. So... Dorothea, with the uh, with the delightful detective, what do you what story do you present her about what's going on in the in the castle? Um, we are a group of researchers looking into um, the local folklore. Obviously, um, having someone with a more scientific eye is helpful to these things. Once we apply our knowledge of science and human anatomy and and logic to these folklore, we can we can see where you know, our ancestors came up with these interesting creatures and what they possibly could have been in reality. It's, it's a very fascinating study. Hmm. Yeah, she, she nods, uh, and is nodding away to that. Thinking, well, uh, science and, and folklore, there's a, there's a combination I wouldn't have uh, put together. <laughs> Everything can be explained with science, detective. Believe me, this is, and this is, this is my goal. What can we explain using science? Hmm. Yeah, she she nods quite quite impressed. Otherwise, we'll say continue jotting down uh, jotting down some notes, and eventually she will be. She'll say, "Right, well, well, we're done. Let's uh, go out and find where where the rest of your friends have got to." Yes, and let's you'll do be that. Uh, following up behind the behind the others as you mm-hmm. get around that corner. The first thing that greets you is a, almost a lattice of what look to be boards, um, long, old, probably even flo- repurposed floorboards that have been pulled up and then used to block the corridor going ahead. But they're not doing a great job. Some of them have fallen down over time and there are gaps that could even have the head fit through one of these gaps. And um, Through them, you can see going off into the distance a long corridor which runs the length of this side of the building, but there's almost no light until you get to the end. Hence why I was saying about maybe you want to light your lamp to go down this the dark bit of the corridor. Anybody anybody have a crowbar? <laughs> I believe someone does. I I, I do. <laughs> he really does have every prop needed in arm's reach. <laughs> right, uh, so... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, with your uh, light, Sora, and I just want to see what's whether this obstruction was put up uh, because of danger or because somebody wanted illicit privacy or some such. Um, so, on the other side of these gap of this mass, is there a floor? Yes, there is floor. Um, you can see a long. Uh, what's very much now threadbare red carpet which just runs the length of the corridor and either side of the corridor facing each other there are a set sets of doors that presumably lead into some obviously rooms that face the exterior of the building some that are interior there's seven in total so there's two four six and then one that's on the right hand side which equi- which equates to an interior room right at the end all of the doors are boarded up and once you're prizing these boards off that block the corridor itself they're they're almost coming out without much effort at all Mm -hmm. these these boards have been here for a long long time all right so it looks like somebody wanted to separate this area or keep something inside it but before any of us got here, maybe before the society left. Well, and whatever, I mean, somebody's still back here and if they've irritated something, I mean, how's we, your, we gotta find whoever's back here before they cause more harm. How's, how's your pup 
feel about this area uh, yeah once once we get in past it uh the dog sniffing around because we pick up mm-hmm. the scent of uh of our good friend uh who broke in mm-hmm. yeah the um the doggy runs off into the gloom you're reaching the edge of the lantern light see at the far end of the corridor there's a window which opens up as, you, as your eyes become accustomed to the light and as you get closer with the lantern, passing these rows of boarded up doors, you can see big, thick, heavy oak doors behind them, which are almost completely covered by the, by the boards nailed into the door frames. The end of the corridor just doesn't seem to make too much sense. But you've got three doors set on the left, four doors on the right. You get to a long space of blank wall and then at the end of that blank wall it immediately takes a right angle and opens up into an empty space where there's then windows that represent this is the corner of the building which having seen from the outside where you saw the broken uh, the broken window frame and you saw the broken pane of glass it would correspond that that room is the bigger room that's off to your left but there's no door into it Is is looking down in the vicinity of the corridor in front of us, I'd assume there's lots of dust. Does any of that seem to be disturbed? Weirdly, no. The, the, only, dis- the only disturbance that you're seeing in it is the footprints that you are making now. It, it almost appears as though no one has been down here in decades. Yeah, the, the entered, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of like put my like tap the wall a little bit there they entered behind this wall as as you tap you you tap a couple of uh, just like maybe a couple of inches apart uh, there's a very definite thud 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 of solid wall and then a hollow thud thud or kind of tap 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 when you tap again with the with the stick uh, okay. shall crowbar again yeah. Okay. You start smashing away at the wall, and as you start prying bits back, you're finding that this is an old uh, facade that's been put up covering completely another doorway. So you start pulling back pieces of uh, plasterboard and finding yeah, that there's a door that's been completely covered over. Uh, you're pulling aside the uh, chunks of this and revealing the door frame itself and got another big thick heavy oak door which matches position with the one that's on the other side of the corridor so you've now there are eight doors you can see there are four on one side four on the other they boarded but, up seven and plastered over an eighth mm-hmm. and as you are pulling aside large chunks of it you suddenly find the edge of what looks to be a piece of parchment as if there's something nailed or like a note nailed to the door. Uh, Soren, bring the light up, please. Certainly. All right. And this is what you find nailed to the door. Order number 143, by order of the Council of the Uppsala branch of the Order of Artemis, this room is declared off limits in perpetuity. This room is never to be opened while Castle Gillenkreutz still stands. Approved by the undersigned, Conrad Greer, Sigrid Frisk, Stefan Larson. For what it's worth, I am eternally sorry, Johan. And the seal. Well, we have a Johan. Mm. Does, does this, does the, uh, this might be difficult to to ascertain, but does the uh, that Johann's scratched note does that look to be much newer than the original post, or does the original post look like super old, crackling, crusted writing, and that's newer ink? Right. Uh, you can you can give me an investigation roll. Oh yes, here we go. Mm-hmm. I think I have a total of next to. Not many dice. Let's see, that would be logic. Yep, logic. Okay. 
three dice. Uh, and I got a six, three, three, six. Hey. You're fairly sure that the, the note that's written, say, for, for what it's worth, is roughly at the same time this uh, this sheet was made. It's probably an addition afterwards. You're, that's, you're fairly sure just by the well, the angle and where it makes sure that it doesn't interfere with the other pre-existing signatures on there and the wax seal down in the bottom right-hand corner. But it also gives you an idea of how old this thing is. Uh, this is well over a century old. This has been here for a long time. Yeah. Interesting that the note on our door. Well... I, if, you know, kind of speaking a little low so the constable doesn't hear us talking about crazy things. Um, our burglar trio let something out of this room, I think, that wants right. whoever trapped it in here, this Johan, to pay, but uh, whatever it is, it doesn't have a good sense of time. I think uh, we'd have a better time finding Johan amid the gravestones out back and then among the living. But if it's already out, do you think there's further harm um, in taking a look at what was inside if it was already let out through the window? Probably Only not. superstitious, but when I see something that is sealed and promises to keep something closed in perpetuity... I I want to keep it closed. I I mean I would I would agree with agree with that, but they've already yeah the room's yeah. already been breached. I mean there might be another body. Somebody by elves might be dead or hiding in here still. Who could tell us something? Yeah, more likely dead. Do, do we have a sense of how big this this room is? Is it is it like a uh, like a huge gallery type sized room that it sort of looks like? Or? You know, we can pop open the door opposite and probably get a decent sense. It's just going to take a second. Yeah, I'm curious to see if, the, if there's disturbance in there, because there's no disturbance out here in, in the dust. No, but they, they uh, Soren, they broke into the sealed room. Yeah. So, And there's no way from that sealed room for them who have gotten out, it seems. Yeah, so it exited just through the window. Hopefully that's the only exit. When they closed that door forever a hundred years ago, they, the it's been closed. Uh, so this thing has been waiting to get out, right? And they let it out through the window, and it leaves a message in blood for us downstairs. It could be anywhere. Yeah, it's not going to come back. It, it walked prison. right in through the front door. Yeah. We need to talk to the girl, see why, what their reasoning was behind doing this. Kids are kids. But... It's yeah. We need to speak to her. She's I mean, a liar. If there's, and... Even if there's some kind of rumor or local story, I haven't heard anything about that, so I'd like to know. Uh, so if we pop open the door opposite on the hall, I assume that answers the crowbar readily. Yep, the crowbar is easy to pull that down. Again, these these rooms have been boarded up for multiple decades, and it's so... more or less empty. It's very dusty. Are there connecting doors? I'm wondering if that's why the whole hallway is closed off is because they were connecting doors. There are connecting doors, but not to either side. Um, you probably end up prying a couple of these open to, uh, to get the full picture of what's actually there. That they open up into sets of two. So you end up going to the next one down the corridor, going back the way you came, pop that open. And the, there is an interior door, but otherwise the entire room is completely empty. There's no furnishings, there's nothing in there, even down to the floorboards. And even it looks like maybe traces of salt were put down on the floor as well a long, a long time ago. And even maybe burns or at least scorch marks in the, in the wood, wooden floorboards. That there is a door, but it leads off to the door that's going even further back down the corridor. And when you open that one up, there's the door corresponding going back the other way, but not one that goes back to the one further down. So it's sets of two that it's adjoining rooms. So set of two, set of two, set of two. Like an old hotel, there. perhaps. Kind of. But when you presume you haven't opened up the one that 
you um that's sealed with the order nailed to the door. Not yet. If the same pattern continued, there should be a door that would open up to that big empty space at the end of the corridor where a room should be in the corner of the building. But there's nothing there. It's just as if it's empty space where they just forgot to build a room. Uh, and if we tap that wall, do we find another hollow? Solid. It, it breaks the pattern, which doesn't seem to make sense, especially because the, uh, the doors on the other side of the corridor, if you open those up, the pattern continues and it does actually link those two end rooms together. So this, this is almost like a intentional prison cell. Do we want to get the officials out of here? Yes. And do yes. this on our own? <laughs> yes. I'm downstairs that. entertaining the damn detective. <laughs> In fact, she is uh, she is anxiously waiting for the last uh, the last folks to come down and give their statements. All right. Well, I'll... and if yeah, if the dog hasn't picked up a scent, um, I can be relative. Well, the dog does pick up a scent. It goes to that door that you. That door wants to. It wants it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they were all inside this room. So whatever harm there was from breaching it, it's damage done. Um, I need to go talk to the detective. I've been a little dodgy ever since uh, going out with Gustav in the morning. Uh, so you continue. I'll, I'll go back and I'll link back up with the constable wherever he's, uh, you know, oh, she, very perplexed. Oh, the constable's a he. Yeah. Yeah. Wherever he's looking about perplexed. Uh, yeah. Let's get, let's get him out and let's, let's all go downstairs and make nice and get them out of here so we can do some work. Yeah, the constable returns to doing the thing that uh, requires the least amount of brain power. So he goes down and basically stands guard over the head that's still uh, still in the hallway. Somebody's got to do it, you know, important job. Mm -hmm. but he gets paid to do it too. Right, so what does Torrin uh, give us her answer to, to the detective? Well, I'm not much in the ways of the brains as everybody else is around here, but... Uh... I help keep the uh, the premises uh, rodent free. You know, make sure that animals aren't eating their books. Hmm. Yeah, I imagine with the, I mean, I've got, got a glance at the place as I like, uh, was obviously walking up. Seems like the gardens are a bit overgrown, so I imagine you might have a bit of a vermin problem out there. Yeah, kind of well, uh, between, between me and the dogs... Uh, Uh, ho hopefully make quick work of them. Can't stand rats. Hate rats. Yeah, I mean, I, there's very, very few people do. <laughs> mm. I guess she's otherwise jotting down a few notes, not particularly anything detailed. You only see her make a couple of words at a time whenever she jots anything down. Yeah, otherwise, it's quite happy with your uh, the description of being the almost like the groundskeeper type, and I think the last one then will be to bring in Oscar. Yeah, uh, and not knowing, uh, I mean, I assume that being that we've known each other for a few investigations in the past, mm -hmm. we have something of a baseline story. Um, I'm not sure that. I, I'm going to pass for somebody who works for Uppsala University, but I'm a great manipulator, so I'm going to head that way mostly. Mm -hmm. like, you know, it's a uh, we have the deed of the place; the place needs fixing up. Uh, we have similar interests, and that's the long and the short of it, really. Gotcha. Yeah, again, she she takes down some very uh, very basic notes. Alongside it confirms with everything else that everyone else has said. It's just like the seven of you that are there. So the five of you and then the two staff that you're doing some kind of folklore research, the various people need to start tend the guard, attend the grounds, rebuild the place. But yeah, she's quite happy with it. It seems to match up with everyone. I mean, to, to put this in perspective as well, this is the first time you've actually had the authorities come to the castle because it's the first time anything's going to happen on your doorstep. But uh, yeah, in, she, in our doorstep, no less. Indeed. In our doors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she 
takes her notes, closes up the notebook, pops it in her outside pocket of her long coat, and then tries to gather everyone together. So back in the sitting room, just say, well, thank you for everyone for being so cooperative. Uh, so I'm sorry this has uh, obviously happened on the property and has disturbed and kind of put a real dampener on the beginning of your day. Um, if we do have any questions or anything arises, uh, we'd like to be able to get in touch with you so we can, so we're just down the road so we can easily come come down here and knock on the door. Or likewise, if, if anything that you discover, uh, if there's something that hasn't been turned up so far in the investigation that you want to let us know, then f please feel free to come, come down and come down and give us a, hel a helping hand. Well, uh, Detective, I mean, if you do manage to find uh, that Sophia again, I'd be very curious what she wanted to take from us breaking into her window as she did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we've got her address um, down at the, somewhere near the train station, I think it was. Uh, once once we've, once we've sorted out everything with the, with the body and obviously made, I've uh, written up some of our, some of our preliminary notes, I think we'd better go and pay her a visit. I, I think she she might have more information if she knows that you know that she's lying. Um, when you take the head away, can we just mop it or anything? Do we have to? Yeah, no. We, we've we've taken notes as to what was here, the message that was on the on the door. Um, obviously, we'll we'll take the take the body and put it with the rest of the oh the head and put it with the rest of the body. Mm. Um, but yeah, feel free to clean up. We won't. We're not going to ask you to have that up there in perpetuity. Yeah, thanks. It's right. not like oh, they should learn anything from blood, anyway. It's just a mess. Yeah. <laughs> so what? What forensics? A pipe dream? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think we'll pursue pressing charges for the breaking and entering. That it's there's that area. That I don't believe there was anything worth. Uh, Stealing. It's it's mostly in realm. Okay, if you're not pressing charges, then uh, I don't see uh, we won't treat it with kind of any urgency. Going to follow up and having having a word with her, then we can we can do that at a much later much later point if we uh, need to. I mean, <laughs> she's still a material witness to the murder, murder. of her boyfriend. Oh, and yeah, there's a missing true. person involved. Yes, yeah. there's so. there's there's somebody else at large, and they 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 crept up to our property and you know lied about you know they, they gave you a false report. Um, I want to I'm I'm curious as 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 to why. I mean, yeah. as someone who's lives here, it's not a every day that somebody comes you know breaking in through your windows and. Hmm. Yeah, you you can see her kind of thinking this through. Yeah, actually, I think we will probably go and pay her a visit then. Yeah, hopefully maybe later on this, maybe this afternoon, going to go and have a word with her about what's what's going on with her. Hmm. That's good. Thank, thank you for that. And otherwise, she makes her farewells and again thanks you all for being uh, very helpful and being very open and honest and cooperative. And uh, Al got the butler shows her out, and along with the constable, who promptly picks up the head and carries it away. Hello. So while I was busy with the detective and entertaining, what um, what did we figure out? Well, there's a uh, some kind of sealed space upstairs that they broke into uh, from the outside window, and it was sealed on the order of somebody, including a uh, Johan. But but did you say that the the break of the window was old? No, 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 no. There, there were two windows broken. Huh. One of them a long time ago, and one of them probably last night, into a wing that's been boarded up for decades or a century or more. On the second floor. On the second floor on that wing. The, the uh, old damage. That was from the rock. The, the old damage dam was, yeah, something like a rock through a window. The new damage was a breaking and entering looking situation. They probably scaled a drain pipe. Those, we, yes. Those windows were in separate rooms, Matt. Like we could find, same. yeah, we could find the room with the rock thrown through it. They're on the same bay window. There's three sides to oh, it. Oh, there's three. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So the one in the center is 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 curtained. 
the one that was broken was broken a long time ago with a rock and the one that was pried open was pried open recently. Exactly and that's that. probably what caused the escape of something that was locked up in there for a hundred years. The hallway is completely untouched. But so I, what I wanted to look at is the, I mean, I assume we locked the front doors at night. So whatever yeah, you, brought you the head those. in had to come in. It didn't come in. It didn't come down the stairs from that wing with the head apparently because it didn't well, leave any mark on the stairs but the dog did track the scent going that way right did the ceilings have any indication of movement no so we might have a floater i don't know yes yeah, whatever i i have some experience with with this i i recognize the marks on that boy's body and all i can say is we are very lucky that he has been torn apart. Otherwise, he'd be rising up from the slab in a few what, hours. What do you think, I don't. What do you think it was? I I don't I don't know. All I know is I treated a man who had injuries similar to this. He died in my arms, father. But on the autopsy table, I tell you, he got up again, <laughs> and I flew and I fled. And he begged me. His dying words were, "When I get up again." finish me off so he whatever whatever happened to him he knew that he was going to get up again so well if there is another person in that room they might be getting up again round about now so i think it's in our best interest to to take a look in there well the question is is do you think that if there is something trapped in that room that it needs a door opened to get out. It, it's not. It's not trapped. It it got out the window and put stuff downstairs. It's what not if we? Yeah. What well, if I'm we assuming just... breaking the window opened the seal. Like if it was sealed. Yeah, now, the window itself wasn't keeping it in. It, it could smash through ordinarily, but yeah, there was and, some and the, sort of seal, some sort the of rock. Like like the rock didn't let it out. No. And there was there was like a salt along the base. So, I mean, if they had broken into the window and disturbed some kind of salt barrier or something like of that nature, when they came in through the window, physically breaking it open, that the rock throw the rock didn't, but their upheaval of the window did. Yeah. Whatever it was, it's incomplete now and it's gone. Or I don't know if it's still in there, but it's but the, the pronouncement said not to go in. Yeah, but I somebody's if... already gone in. <laughs> yeah, it's about to, I, th I think that is, we're long past that. And yeah, the what they, somebody's gone in and one of the people who's went in his head was put downstairs, their body impaled, and they broke their blood on our door. It's already it, out. It, it still might behoove us to go into the room. We might get a clue or two in where it's spent so long as to yeah, I, what I, I it agree. Is. I want to go in there. I would like to do some more research. I would like to know what it is we're up against and what could be in that room beyond. Well, what what do you suspect? Are you thinking something along the lines of vampire or werewolf? I don't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I. I... Oh, uh, the, the thing. The thing, Father, is whatever it was. Its uh, footprint was about a large footprint. Then clawed, it wouldn't be a, a vampire. And clawed hands. Clawed. So and whatever it is, it creates more of itself as it kills. I don't. Yes. Perhaps so. lycanthrope, or yeah. um, I was You're just muted. wondering if perhaps we should drill a hole and peek through it before we breach the door. But maybe well, uh, the first thing is we've got a large library, and there were three names on the document that sealed the door yes. in addition to Johann's, and one of them was a Frisk. So we need to get all gutted in here right now and figure out whether or not. What, he, what the family tradition knows about what's in there, and if there's a document in the library about why they sealed it off. Let's did also see if we can make some uh, spiritual precautions. Did the butler come with the house, basically, or did we yeah. hire somebody on? He turned up pretty okay. much after you, after you had been to go and see Linnea down at the asylum um, when she gave you the deeds and the keys. That As you were getting settled in, he just showed up and basically said... Yeah, my my family's been your servants to the uh, to the society for a long, long time. I'm quite prepared to offer my services. Yeah, we need to talk to him then. And yeah, I mean, we if, have... 
we don't have to drill through the door either to get a look. The window is already busted open. Yeah, can we easily scale the outside? Go the same way they did, up the drain pipe. <laughs> I will leave that to those of you who are more physical. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'll be in I'll the happily, library. I'll happily clamber up there if we don't want to go through the door here. Well, I'm sure there's a ladder somewhere here. I think probably a ladder and the drain pipe as a dual technology would be wise precaution. But well, we might as well read it if there's anything about it before we stick our faces into the dark I unknown. Help. I can help with the research. Okay. So is Wait. there are there bell pulls to ring for Fisk and the chef? It's, it's more like we... yell. Uh, <laughs> 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 right, we, well, in terms of mechanical uh, procedures, or at least the steps in an investigation, you're getting close to the preparation stage because you're getting an idea of what's what's actually afoot. So have a think about skills you might want to put your advantage into. For them and say so when, when you've got an idea of something, let me know and say how you're how you're bringing that into the fiction, and then we can we can make a note of that. But you, you yell for Fisk, and he promptly comes up the uh, comes up the stairs with his heavy old feet, slightly hunched over, almost like a, a lurch type figure, and so slowly comes down the corridor. So you, say, you you yelled, sir. We know that, uh, thanks for coming, Frisk. Um, we appear to have had a recent intruder in that wing last night that released something that caused the mayhem that you saw in the foyer. Hmm. Uh, and the, the rest of that lad, uh, I, I fell in pair, uh, Bachland, is, is being removed from the fence on that side. Um, that wing, or that, the second floor, there are a series of rooms that were uh, long ago uh, barred to transit hastily, wooden barricade sort of thing. Um, and there was an order not to disturb a particular room that was plastered over. And a frisk is one of the signatories of that letter. Oh. Was your family always only in service or were they also society members or... Ooh, he, uh, he always does that for a long exhale. Well, there was a, there's talk of going back uh, many generations, uh, so that there was uh, one member of the uh, one member of the line that was uh, part of the part of the council here, but that was uh, I mean, I'm not too well versed on going back that far, but I believe it uh, the society wasn't always called the society back then. The council it was. Well, I mean, the uh, the society was some, called something else, but they've had they've had a council uh, throughout the various iterations that the society mm. has. Had. Oh, was your uh, does the name Artemis ring a bell? Hmm. Because he kind of connection thinks. with this ancestor of yours who was on the council. Yeah, that 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 was it. It was the precursor to the uh, this is as I said, the society wasn't always called the society. If I, if I remember right, it was. Uh, Rather famous individual, uh, Carl Linnaeus, that renamed the uh, the Order of Artemis to the uh, to the Society. Yeah, so that was the, the the name it had before. Yeah, it was sealed. The room was sealed under the Council of the Order of Artemis, and there was a uh, a frisk on there. So I think this might be your ancestor. Oh, no! Oh, nice, nice to see. Uh, nice to see little bits of the family still still here. Uh, do you have? Do you have family records, journals, something that might be from? Or is there a part of the individual? library that has records of the society? Bingo. Yeah, he he is about. He was about to jump in and say, "Well, I personally don't have records, but if there would be records anywhere here, sir, it would be in the uh, or arm um, rather, uh, it would indeed be in the library." Well, excellent. If you can, if you can indicate the, a likely area for us to begin, it'll save time. Oh, um, sure, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go and have a look now. It's uh, been a while since I've uh, actually used the library. I've mainly dusted the uh, the books, but uh, I'll go with you. 
Okay. So you, a few of you head off towards the library. So start the start looking at the books there. So the father's going there. Who else is heading to do research? Okay, that's that's easy. It's one side of my screen. Uh, Torum, what about what are you doing? Well, I am greatly concerned uh, that something is loose in the house uh, that brought, you know, that that's done this. Um, and I would love to know. Uh, you know where where it is so i think what i'm going to start doing while they're doing research i mean this thing seemed to like it didn't leave tracks but it came down the hallway uh so it moves through the air so i want to start like stringing up little like almost like bell wires like mm -hmm. little strings with like bells but high like we can duck under them but i want to catch things that are mm -hmm. moving through hallways through the air <laughs> cunning yep you can you can start rigging those up we'll take a little bit of time but definitely doable and soren i'm going to go to the uh maybe get some salt like a like a sack of salt from the kitchen and i'm going to accompany torrent I, I don't want to be splitting up i think uh i will help torrin start the the patrolling and scouring of this place no worries uh, you meet obviously the chef down there uh, she's promptly setting up breakfast and getting a nice uh, nice array of bacon eggs and other such uh, other such delicious food ready um, she does uh, ask you oh, with one eyebrow raised you know, you're not planning on eating all that are you oh no 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 this this is for an important experiment we're performing oh okay I'll uh, I'll add some salt to the shopping list then to uh, to go and get sure. some some more later. Oh, certainly, certainly. Yes. All right. So you start accompanying Torren, uh, going round that part, stringing up bits and yeah, the second the second story, some major hallways, you know, downstairs. But yeah, again, like about almost mid height. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, if you were not paying attention, we could walk into them, which is not ideal. But I'm mm -hmm. trying to cover <laughs> so gotcha. something tall, floating couldn't would struggle going. Anyway, mm -hmm. if that makes uh, sense, because they're, yeah, they're yeah, not yeah, they're yeah. not low to the ground because we're not trying to catch a human intruder. We're trying to catch something that floats its movement. Mm -hmm. So I'm stringing up bells in the middle. Yep, no problem. So that that will roughly happen about the same kind of time that it takes research to happen. So. Mm -hmm. In the library, uh, we'll go just down the list. What is the father attempting to research in particular? Because you've got a few different things that, as you've identified, that you could potentially be researching here. Well, I think the most important thing is to try to figure out what the thing is. So um, uh, we're in Uppsala. Uh, I'm going to look and see what are the more common um, myths about, you know, creatures, and see if anything see if anything matches a large, shadowy, big-footed, clawed monster. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're trying to identify what basin this could be potentially be from the from the evidence you've got so far, Dorothea. Um, I think I'll look into then um, the council, like these these people, maybe even the history of the castle, if there's anything that exists, maybe that would explain mm -hmm. what has been sealed away, yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah, you, uh, specifically, you're, you're including that bit about maybe what's in there to see if there's any written... Yeah, if it, I, I guess I'd double down, like really focus in on the history of the castle and if there's an account of like what happened that led to that, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I was thinking of journals and diaries of the or or notes of proceedings of the institution. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing that should be like probably matching bindings. They, they had meetings. They had minutes. I assume. Yep. And so you have, that's, you have an order number that will give you something to particularly try and hone in on. Yeah. Okay. Right. Learning roles, please, from the three of you. Now, is, is this a point that I might be adding th things to my skill role before we 
if if you wish to so if you're thinking that this is going to be research is going to be something that you would want to focus in on you can say your advantages with that and then cash it in on this role now or another role later and the advantage does what it adds one one dice two dice two dice hmm. yeah, I I, it, because this is a weakness of mine i think it's a it's a good placement i think i'll okay. be a more well-rounded human and i'm eager to learn I got two sixes and I didn't use my advantage. Okay. Um, one from Dorothea and any from Oscar? No. Uh, so the way the dice fall, I rarely get sixes either. So. I, I didn't get anything above three out of six dice. <laughs> All right. I'm going to send Dorothea via message a particularly long handout. Okay. So hopefully that should be appearing. Yes, I see right. it. All right. And actually I'll send you another one because you did kind of meet the criteria to say you were looking for two specific pieces of info. So there you go, you should have another one. All right, Oscar is kind of looking through the books here and finding, yeah, there's there's various articles you've got that or various books that have the same kind of matching spine as if they're all a long series of books on the same subject. And the thing that catches your eye is that they've all got that same kind of bow and arrow motif. That even with not getting any successes, you can at least pin to uh, piece together that is a symbol that is related to the historical or mythological Artemis. Artemis the, the hunter. hunter. Yeah. yeah. So at least you've, you've kind of, you're honing in on the right area, but you're just not finding anything particularly relevant in here. There's just, there's so many books in this corner of the, the library that it's, yeah, you're just not really finding anything useful yet, but maybe give them more time perhaps. As father, you start pouring through various accounts, probably the more recent documentation here. And even the most recent stuff is still 10 years old because the society just stopped or just came to a halt 10 years ago. So there's, there's definitely a bit of lag in the history here. But with two successes, you're able to start narrowing it down to a very particular type of basin. There's a few different encounters which are documented in the society's records with things like what the uh, the good doctor mentioned about the things coming back from the dead. And the one that you hone in on specifically when you think of, well, it isn't uh, like a regular, like a well, not zombie, that's a, not a term that would be used here, but not like a walking corpse. This is something that's more distorted, more animalistic, more monstrous. And you come upon records of what is referred to as a revenant. Revenant. Yeah. These... These are creatures which are born of hate, that when someone dies and they have so much hate and so much loathing left, it's a force that almost becomes manifest in its own right, that it's not so much made from the remains of the, body, of the person that died, but is a manifestation of their well, intense Eastern, will yeah. to, come, uh, to come back, and that it forms this well he forms a being but the description varies slightly from entity to entity but there's monstrous elongated uh dog-like skeletal these are all adjectives which are described to various different instances where these things have been fought but you do get certain commonalities between them that maybe start to explain what happened in that corridor upstairs that they are known to be able to go insubstantial and fly. So they can be physical and they can be ghost-like. So they could pass through walls. They can fly through the air at great speed. Yeah, they are particularly nasty creatures. And did they, did they always start with a person uh, yes. being, being full of hatred? A person yeah, full I, of hatred. Particularly loathsome individuals uh, create revenants upon their, upon their passing which 
carry their memories, their their goals, their yeah, as I said, their hatred carries with them. So Oscar, they are intelligent. So Oscar, we might be looking for a revenant, something or someone that maybe was part of this castle or part of the society that was filled with hatred, Mm -hmm. uh, sinful, sinful, very sinful. Mm -hmm. And when they die, they become a kind of undead monster, not, not so much corpse, but a, a spirit of evil able to take different forms, possibly able to become incorporeal and fly. Um, and that might have been what was locked up in that room. Oh, my God. Yeah. With two successes as well, you do get a bit more information, which is relevant in, a, in that short space of time. You also learn of various rituals or practices which can be used to banish them. Ah. Um, there's various ways of doing it, and they also have different bands or different banes. Um, they are repelled, or at least they are unable to pass by crosses. Um, if you were to paint a cross in tar on a wall, for instance, they wouldn't be able to pass through the wall. Um, likewise, hanging a cross on a surface or would bar an entrance they couldn't pass through. Um, they can't attack people that wear crosses, although potentially they could manipulate the environment as long as they could get that cross off someone, then they could attack them. Um, but ways to be able to destroy them would involve interring the body or the remains in sacred ground or or potentially destroying the corpse by salting and burning the uh, the remains would also be another way to uh, to save that if you didn't have sacred ground nearby well the chapel is probably consecrated ground Um, sometimes there are places underneath the altar where you can put bodies Um, I'll have to check that out Oh, you haven't explored that. Sorry. Well, I, I, there, believe it or not, there's actually weeds that have been growing right into the, the building from the outside. I've been cutting back the rose bushes, and um, it's hard. It, it, it's an old, old chapel. So. Yeah, there are also those headstones on the sort of north, like north, yeah. east side of the plot. I Don't mess with the a... burial mounds. Don't mess with them. No, but I could consecrate them, of course. No, don't. I, I like. I'm looking up from my work now. Don't mess with them. Don't mess with them, Father. What? Oh my God. What What have you found? I uh, I, I can go. You, if you want me to read, the, I can read the whole document. It, it's the, the the account of what yeah. happened that led to that room being sealed away. My my God. Please tell us. Minutes of the emergency meeting of the Council of the Order of Artemis, Uppsala Branch, 17th of May, 1702. Present, Conrad Growers, council member, Sigurd Frisk, council member, Stefan Larson, council member, and Johann Falkengard, member of order. Meeting called following the events of the previous evening. A fire spread quickly through the majority of the city and as much of it now lays in, and much of it now lays in ruins. Rebuilding will likely take decades to complete. The death toll as yet is unknown. The council acknowledges that the actions of JF spared Castle Gillenkreutz and its occupants. However, JF has admitted to overstepping the bounds of his authority in order to make this happen. JF also admits to have been involved in a romantic relationship with another member of the order, Emma Bachvist, hereafter EB. JF has informed the council that EB was actively involved in the interrogation of Vason to learn from them. Examination of her quarters and documents found therein confirm that while valuable information has been obtained, her methods were considered cruel and extreme by the council, who were not previously aware of such methods being employed prior to the events of the last 48 hours. EB was currently in possession of a fairy queen, Queen Myadrama, hereafter QM, E.B. had previously torn off her wings and scarred her body with iron implements. J.F. was familiar with the abilities of the fairies. When it became apparent that the fire was encircling the castle, J.F. broke into E.B.'s quarters and confronted the imprisoned Q.M., asking for its help to protect the castle and its occupants with its magic. 
QM agreed to assist if the council agreed to her terms, specifically that QM would be given EB to, quote, do unto Emma as it has been done unto her. JF agreed to QM's terms, thus overstepping the bounds of his authority to make a decision on behalf of the order as a whole. QM promptly placed an invisible barrier around the boundary of the castle that the fire could not cross. As far as the city authorities are concerned, a fire break was created by manually clearing the vegetation on the extremities of the grounds before the fire came too close. QM then removed the second room of EB's quarters from the castle containing her interrogation slash torture facilities. EB vanished at approximately the same time in front of the other members of the order in the library that were attempting to move more precious volumes to the basement for their safety. JF introduced QM to the council after the barrier was confirmed to be in place. JF explained his actions and his motivation for doing so. QM informed the council that she and her subjects would relocate to the grounds of the castle so that they could be close to their new pet, EB. They would inflict the same pain to EB as EB had done to her basin victims. The council agreed, although note in this meeting that they feel they had been put in a position where they had no other option. The authorities have been informed that EB perished in the effort to establish the firebreak. A cross from her has been placed on the old burial mound on the grounds. QM informs the council that this mound will henceforth be the location of her new court. QM informed the council that reparations would take place in EB's own torture chamber, now moved into nowhere, which shall, be still, shall still be accessible in the hours of darkness from her remaining room. Given the nature of EB's fate, it is the opinion of the order that there is a significant chance that EB may become irrevenant. The door to nowhere has been sealed with a cross with such a basin, which such a basin is not able to cross. A council order has been placed upon the door to EB's quarters, dictating that the room shall remain sealed so that the cross may not be removed and any revenant EB may become shall not be permitted to escape. This has been logged in the order records as order 143. In response to the misconduct of JF overstepping his authority, the council have opted to leniency, giving the extenuating circumstances. No formal reprimand will be made in light of JF having preserved Castle Gill and Crates, its occupants in the library of records. The council do admit that the loss of EB is regrettable, but also reiterate that her methods were aberrant and would not have been allowed if can to continue if they come to light earlier. In closing remarks, JF would like to express the depth of his sorrow for the fate he has condemned his beloved EB to. He is also objected to her, to her methods, but remains hopeful that God shall take pity on her when the end comes and prevent her from rising once again as a revenant. Well, I guess that explains why she wants Johan so badly. It's now we know a great deal. My God. I must find a way to drive the revenant back or destroy it. As there was a very specific piece of information right towards the beginning of that, you can also, everyone, give me uh, learning roles for a reference. Two sixes again. Uh, Oscar's stunned silence. Zero. No, nothing here. Oh, okay. In which case, uh, the good father, maybe you have... Uh, fairly good knowledge of history of Uppsala? Yes, um, they're referring to the Great Fire of Uppsala. It took place on the 16th of May, 1702, and it reduced about three quarters of the city to ruins. The scale of the destruction ultimately resulted in Uppsala losing its status as the country's second largest city uh, and coronation city. Uh, two of the city's most prominent landmarks were severely damaged in the fire, but remained standing. Repairs to Uppsala Cathedral and Uppsala Castle uh, took years to complete. For example, the repairs to the castle were only completed in the last 1750s. Very few of the city's major buildings survived unscathed. Uh, Gustavianum, uh, the university building with its prestigious library, was one such lucky structure. Other parts of the university were not so lucky, such as the botanical gardens. The rebuilt gardens after the fire would become the Linnaeus Garden. Another building that was miraculously survived by uh, the Great Fire was Castle uh, Gillencruz, which uh, dated back to the early 17th century. The only districts that survived the fire intact were those to the northwest 
and west of the cathedral. Following the fire, a number of districts in the city were completely redesigned to reduce the chances of any future fire spreading as extensively as in 1702. Buildings were not permitted to be built so close to the riverbanks, and buildings in the vicinity of the cathedral were only allowed to be built from stone. <clears throat> Otherwise, many of the ruined structures were rebuilt as before, keeping the city's plan much as it had been before. The reconstruction of the city led to a distinct contrast of styles either side of the Frist River. The western side of the city, dominated by academic and religious institutions, was mostly built of stone, while the business district in the east was mainly built of wood. Lesser fires hit the city again in 1766, destroying a quarter of Uppsala, uh, mainly affecting central uh, Kungstangroten uh, and the borders of neighboring uh, Svartbach and uh, and 1809, mainly affecting uh, Fjordigen, uh west of the cathedral. And that's what I know mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what two sixes gets you. Yeah. <laughs> so we've not only had that original fire, but we've had other fires and other buildings that miraculously survived. That's interesting. Now, yeah, as a as a faithful person, Father, uh, do you think that it's possible that the capture and torture of the Queen that Emma instituted was the cause of the fire that she then saved the Institute from? Certainly could be revenge. It 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 worked out for the captured and tortured queen that the city was ruined and the if, castle in danger. If a queen of the fairies was captured, it's very likely that her court took some action. I don't know. I mean, that this is what we would do was the the line from the account, the, the council felt like they had no other choice. Classic yeah, dealing with sounds, fairies. It sounds very much like a couple of them were doing some rather incredibly unethical things. It's very upsetting. It's, it's monstrous. I mean, and we're hoping to find some balance with these creatures and not thus protect our own people but so these records give us the name of Emma Bokvist they don't give us the full name of Johan but the last name Falkengard oh Falkengard oh I, I'm sorry good I was afraid it was a frisk and that we were going to have to turn our manservor doper to the fairies um, Falkengard well now we know also Falkengard. that we don't want to go into that room during the evening Exactly. Yes. Um, I guess we should also look to see if Johan is in the, the graveyard. I don't I think he died. I'm assuming he uh, must be there. I mean, he but... must be dead by now. Why well, doesn't she know? I mean, I, I don't know what revenants know. I, we should go and join uh, Soren and Torun. Yes. And, and we should paint crosses on every surface. Yes. And make sure they don't I don't go digging up that mound in the backyard or anything. On that note, that seems a good natural point to break. As we've reached about a two hour mark, do people want to take five minutes or so for a quick restroom break? Yes, please. If we're going to deal with fairies in any capacity, we should probably look up what the order has to say about fairies also. Mm. Well, sure we know. We don't do anything. We know that fairies are very dangerous. Well, yes. They all have their own agendas. Oh, there might be records about this particular fairy that's taken up right. residence on the grounds, right? I mean, if it's hosting its court in, her, in the backyard of the place, they might as well. <laughs> well, then she's presumably still alive. It's only well, been a hundred years. probably trapped. Yeah. Yeah. 
Queen no, I mean the, the queen body. too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, the, the queen. queen. Elizabeth is irrelevant, but the queen is still ruling under the mound. Um, I will after this revelation. I will travel into town and see if I can secure at least four other. Well, give them to everybody in the in the household if they don't already and have the them. dogs. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are you getting? Crosses. Oh, okay. Given that you've got the chapel as well, you can certainly have crosses. They like come over stairs, or even makeshift ones. Yeah, sorry, right. Soren's demonstrating. <laughs> I want to get something you can put around your neck with a chain. Is it? Um, I'm not familiar with the lore of, of Vason. Do you have to have the faith to back it up, or does the religious object itself uh, act as a ward? We all have as the faith because this is a. <laughs> as, um, as far as you're aware so far, because this is actually uh, a, a kind of a big part of the background to the game, mm-hmm. um, there's conflicting evidence to su- suggest one way or the other that the physical item itself has power as far as you're aware. It doesn't necessarily have to be the person that's holding it, but then other accounts very much is the faith of the person. That has an effect. So yeah, there's there's evidence to uh, to point both ways. But the priest would say it has. It's not magic. It's not. It's not your faith that's scaring it. It's the object itself because it's a symbol of the thing the creature's afraid of. Well, I'll so. I'll put my faith in all these books that are saying that the scary invisible monster thing can't kill me if I wear one. Right. I have faith that it will that it will work. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, now. If I wanted to make something like holy water, mm-hmm. um, since it's like not a skill or anything, what do I, how would I do that? You use the chapel. You simply head there and say, I'd like to make some. Okay. Well, I'm going to make some vials of holy water just in case. Mm-hmm. Yep, I'm going to go. Make... Sorry. Sorry. I was say, you can make one batch of it. Fault. Now, yeah. How. This is what's called an item of power. Um, how items of power work is that you have, in this case, a uh, like a canteen full or a chalice full or a bowl full of, of font full uh, of holy water. Every time you use it is going to involve that you're splashing a certain amount of it at a target. There's a roll that's made every time you do it to see basically whether your supply runs out. So you don't know uh, necessarily how much or how many uses you've got of it. Because it might be you accidentally splash all of it in one go, or it might oh. be that you it might be that you're able to do it in small doses. You're you're never too sure exactly how much you have left of it. So I can't make a font of it and then fill up little bot little vials with it so that we can each have a thing to yeah, me- me- mechanically it doesn't work like that. Okay. Yeah, you essentially have, or what it would be is you could make a whole batch of it, but you wouldn't necessarily put it in vials. You would have one a ma- one mass of it that you then use, but you can only do one. Um, it's not that you can only do one. You can only make a batch, one batch of it per day. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on cross duty and get a bunch of crosses. Mm-hmm. I am filling everyone in on what we've learned. What is our deadline? What was the it's demand for you dark. on? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, by, by tonight you happen you happen until sundown it said i think we need to see if johan is buried out back and maybe also go talk to that young woman mm-hmm. and i don't <clears throat> i don't know how much a revenant is going to buy into a poetic sense of justice of he's dead now so you should just give it up <laughs> well it's I mean, if he's if he's dead back there, then we know for sure. I don't. I they're don't creatures know. of don't. they're creatures of hatred, so they would just be more hatred filled if they 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 couldn't get to the target they wanted. Now we understand that Emma, the now revenant, has been released by the intrusion of these young people. She killed one. She let one go. What's happening with the third? Is she feeding on 
I, I don't know if she let her go as much as she can oh, across escape. the... Yeah, well, so she hopped the fence. I don't know if the Revenant can get past whatever barrier the Fairy Queen set up on the perimeter. Fair enough. Yes, but I'm less concerned about how Sophia escaped than what the status is of the third boy, whose name we don't even have. No, I think he's going to be in that room, and I think we've already ascertained that going in there is not going to cause any further harm. Unless we do it at night. Just don't do it at night. Yeah, I don't want to do it at night. And, and we only have until sunset to resolve this matter, or Emma is going to act. But, but that break-in just happened. So, yeah, but last, we didn't I, hear anything. Interesting. Big castle. I, actually, I'm yeah. it's a big castle. <laughs> yeah, big castle. Long, distant, boarded up room well, that's completely plastered over. Well, I'm going to go fall. look. I'm going to go see if Johan's buried in the backyard and then maybe go find that young woman. So, right. Would I'm you like company? Process. Yes, of course, Oscar. You're welcome to come with me. All right. So we'll, we'll form the exploratory graveyard and Sophie team. Okay. So Dorothy and Oscar graveyard and then young line girl. What's everyone else doing? Uh, well, I have been laying line, like you know the bells, but mm-hmm. this that doesn't seem like it's going to be much hindrance to this thing that could go incorporeal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm uh, I'm going to the local Uppsala uh, cross shopping store. But what I will <laughs> what I will do, and the idea of home defense along the lines of the bells, I want this. We can restrict its movements through painting things with the tar crosses. So that's what I'm going to be working on is going through tar. And like literally like all day, I am like, I want it going through hallways like the rest of us. I don't want it going through any any <laughs> wall. I'm not entirely sure if it can go through ceilings or floors. So I'm painting them on the ceiling and the floors. Like I don't want it going. I was deliberate. I was deliberately yeah. going to ask, "What surfaces are you painting?" All, so you are all of them, them. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is right. This is a big place, mm-hmm. so I'm going to make sure I'm going to go concurrently with you and make sure no spots left undone. We're all we right. have to do I is mean, so we... surround the room, right? You're not painting everything in the whole castle. Well, we can't paint the whole castle, but. It's gonna the smell. area that we it's know that, that it's been. Yeah, I want, and then if we could even dangle cross. I mean, we've put lines everywhere. We could dangle crosses from some of them. I don't know if yeah. that will stop it from going down the hallway, but it might. Um, who knows? Plus, emergency backup crosses will be on stream, so you know. Okay. Emergency backup. Uh, <laughs> the bell. <laughs> the bell lines will be completely useless. Uh, <laughs> Should we investigate that room? Should 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 one of us do that? Yeah, I I, I want to. Yeah, I definitely want to. I, I I don't want to until I have a cross. Right. And once I do, I will then investigate. That's fair. <laughs> so if we spend the afternoon, I mean it's early in the morning. <clears throat> we follow up outside Leeds. The father finds us some quality crosses that even those of us who don't necessarily believe can clutch with good faith based on the data we have from the past. You guys paint off that area. You, 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 you know, you try to bar the thing. So if we intrude on it, well, there's still a few hours of daylight before it reaches full power. It can't get out after us. We have to find a way. To, we've got a way to ward it off, but we need to find a way to destroy it. So can I do more research to see if I can find that, or do I just know? You pretty much got everything you needed with the with the two successes okay. previously. So you know the various ways to, or rituals to cast to be able to banish it, and the crosses are one way that you can manipulate where it moves and kind of confine it to where it could be. Hey. Now, as you mentioned, you wanted to go off to ye old ye crossy shop and uh, buy some crosses. <laughs> I believe you already have one as part of your equipment. Well, if, yeah. you, if you want, because before game we did our resources rolls, you got four successes 
I will take a cross on a one for one basis if you want to uh, get crosses with points of resources. Okay. Yeah, I'll spend my four res. Uh, I've got five resources. Well, uh, as the group, you got four successes. That was the the roles we made. Oh. Mm -hmm. well, okay. So I'll, I'll buy four crosses for them. Yeah, I cannot think of a better use of the resources <laughs> at mm -hmm. this point. <laughs> Yeah, Plus, I think the, the chapel is probably off limits to the thing just because of the chapel. So if you're in big trouble, get to the chapel. Did, did the rituals that were, were written, did they explain more how salt is used? I heard that that was part of salt. salt is, yeah, salt wasn't connected with the revenant at all. Oh, it wasn't connected at all. Okay. No. Oh, apart mystery. from like uh, destroying the uh, the body, which yeah. the one of the variants on it is you could salt and burn the bones. God. What about they call it? They call it the uh, the Dean and Sam method. Yeah. What about fairies? Do fairies care about salt? Fairies don't. But if you want to give me a learning role, you could fairies know like what some of because because there was salt. There was salt. Yeah. Oh, look, a six. With my three dice, woo! <laughs> yeah. no, um, again, salt is a general. It's almost like a default or a common denominator that it affects a lot of things. Sure, but not fairies. Uh, fairies, actually, the weird thing with them is to try and get them out of their burrow or out of their mounds. Um, cold iron is definitely the traditional ban, but also bellows. That if you have a set of bellows that are blessed by a priest and then you force air into the mound, that will expel them. Hmm. We don't necessarily want to get rid of the fairies at the moment. We really no, definitely don't want to piss them off. No, no, no. And we that don't want to have a war. <laughs> I'd rather not deal with fairies at all if we can hmm. avoid it. If she won't talk to us, we might have to well, involve... after being tortured, she might be incredibly pissed off at human beings. So yeah, Especially hopefully a hundred years of torture, Emma. Well, yeah, both that's rather parties. vindictive though. So Zeta members and the clergy, neither one probably fairy favorites. Well, we'll see. Right, so you've got say Dorothea, Oscar heading to already mentioned, Torren having a look at um, having a look at fairies, and then going around with plenty of tar and a brush, and taking every every surface possible. Yep, Soren. Um. Hmm. Let's see if there's if there's enough tar, I I I would like to help expedite that because this is a large area and i just don't know like i've painted rooms before and i know that doing one room can take a lot out of you so since we've probably got like a lot more than that that might be good to help so later on in the evening Torin and soren are are not like all cramped up and totally spent i having also done such uh, horrible redecorating when we uh, when we moved in you're on to something there. So having two people doing this will definitely be, you're able to cover a lot more ground. So that's two of you going around with buckets of tar and plenty of brushes. The father heading off to the uh, Yogi Crossy shop. So we'll go to the mound. I presume you're heading to the mound first and then going to the, going to the apartment. Yes. Yes. Looking for Johan's grave. I think tentatively looking at the mound, maybe from, from a distance, but yeah. Okay, when you start heading over to the mound, the first thing that you notice is that having seen the place from a distance before, you know there's plenty of bushes and so, so hedges that surround it. Something big came through here with a fair degree of force fairly recently, clearing a path directly to the mound. And having a look at the beaten up vegetation on the floor, has a rather large and distinctive, almost triangular-like foot. So yeah, this this thing when it got out of the room upstairs last night definitely went through here, 
came towards the mound and you can see started to dig at the surface of one of the graves. Which oh. grave? Uh, yeah, like with you, who's the grave? So you, you'll have to get up close and personal to to read it then. As we're as and we're following these tracks, these substantial, probably maybe traces of blood and the claw marks of these tracks. I'm not so much in the feet, but there will be droplets of blood around here. Spatters. Mm -hmm. uh, they're only going one direction. They go towards the mound, and then you also see them coming away from the mound, heading in the direction back towards the broken window. Okay. So they... Right, right. Mm -hmm. But as you approach the, the mound to get more of a detailed look at the graves in particular, there are seven headstones that form an arc over the top of the mound. These are not ancient, but they're decades upon decades and more than likely heading into three figures old. Having been exposed to the elements for that long, the wood's not been treated. The, the woods themselves, some of the crosses have almost crumbled completely. And the only one that you can even vaguely see any hint of any letters left on that crossbar are the letters E at the beginning of one word and B at the beginning of another word that overlooks this hole that has been dug up by hand or rather by claw, which is the seventh cross right at the very end. The others are completely unreadable. Okay. And, and the, the desecrated hole... Uh, is there a casket sign? Is there a... They haven't got down that far. Uh, it looks like they've only gone down a couple of feet. So evidently, either didn't spend too long doing it, or maybe perhaps they were interrupted. Perhaps the sun coming up. Sun, yeah. Dorotea, do you think that uh, Emma was trying to find her own body because she doesn't understand what she is? I, I, I suppose so. I didn't think that... I, I hadn't thought they buried her here thought that you know they just told the police the lie that she died in the fire and i yeah. thought the fairies but, must have her right they put an empty box in perhaps and she doesn't understand what she is she's been locked up for so long yeah i don't um, uh, i don't feel comfortable just continuing to dig up this mound it makes me nervous i don't want to no i don't want to either. interrupt I, anything i, I want anything i want to send the father back to sort of consecrate this ground and see if that can help her rest, although she probably wasn't here. What was that Let's... girl's last name? Sophie. Uh, it was the uh, the lying little girl, as it's uh, she's been referred to. Yeah, uh, so uh, Sophia or O R R E. Okay. Didn't know if there was a familial connection, maybe that was tying all of this together. Okay. No, I bet those kids just have like rumors about the place. It was empty rumors, for a long yeah. time. Haunted. You know? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, let's go find out. You know, maybe maybe there's more to the story. Uh, so I will stop in the camp, the castle, and I I'd like to advise the father to come and sort of bless this space if he has time. Is that going to like that? Doesn't disturb the well. That's fairies, the question. Is it, it going to is it going to anger the queen more than it appeases the the corpse? Yeah, I don't know what. Uh... Well, he it's his religion. We'll ask him. And then go and grill the... Uh... Yeah, the girl. Mm -hmm. So you're heading back inside to have a word with the father? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, father Nystrom, we, uh, we found evidence... That... Yes, my child. <laughs> <laughs> we found evidence that Emma was trying to dig up her own grave. We don't know if her body is truly down there. Mm. It was not successful in fully digging it up or anything. Uh, she was the Oscar, trying, the Revenant. She was trying to dig up her grave. We don't know if the body's truly down. She may be just confused, not understanding there, her situation. There's a there's a marker that suggests that it's hers, based yes. on its placement and what's left of the writing, and it was scratched at by the a, a creature whose marks match what we've seen. Have we found any evidence? that the creature went back 
to the room. Don't know where he went. She went. We're not sure. I believe yeah. that. We can say something, Matthew. Yeah, I was going to say that there was the fact that you saw the trail uh, initially went through the hedges towards the mound and then did go away back in the direction okay. of that broken window afterwards. Okay. Because sometimes a revenant can get stuck uh, if it uh, if the sun comes up while it's out. Yes, it I believe that's what happened to in her. Its spot. Yeah. But I think that it must have gotten back. I, I, it, my, the feeling that I get from this is that she doesn't understand what she is or what's happened, which is why she's still angry at Johan, why she's looking at her own grave. I also don't think that it's as simple as blessing the grave. It has to be consecrated ground. And I, there's a kind of a ritual that goes with it. You can't, you have to carry the revenant, the, the body over the wall. You can't just walk through the gate of the, the churchyard. Just, I don't want to disturb the residents of the mound. Oh, right. I wonder if we put, a, uh, perhaps we should put some crosses around the mound so that she can't bother them it further. Won't, just, yeah, it won't hurt. Yeah. I bet even uh, simple you know, two pieces of wood would help with that sort of thing too, since it's already I, occupied space. She was in, but she was in the graveyard with all of these crosses as that are acting as grave markers. This, this is not a, a, probably not a consecrated graveyard. Yeah. Just, I, I, or, or most of the grave markers are probably not cruciform. They're probably just stones. Wooden. Right. Okay. Well, she said wooden, so they're probably just wooden slabs that have all rotted away. Well, here's your crosses. Oh yes, thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go find that girl. Maybe, maybe she knows more. Uh, maybe, maybe it's just rumors and kids being kids, but maybe there's more. Uh, well, I'm sure there's nothing but rumors and kids, but she knows what she saw. It's true. What what is it, Torin? Oh no, I was going to talk uh, with once I have my cross. Um, what I'm what I'm going to do is I have my lucky rabbit's foot, and I'm going to put it on the same chain as my advantage. So two dice to resist whatever the hell it's going to try to do. It's like no, I'm not going to remove my lucky rabbit's foot, even if it's the cross. I'm like I'm not going to ditch this. So I'm putting them conscientiously and putting them on the same the same chain. Gotcha. Remember that the devil is a trickster. He can convince you that, oh, I don't want to get my rabbit's foot wet. Take <laughs> uh, this rabbit's foot has been, been with me through hell and back. So. A lovely memento. Right. So with Torin and Soren, nice bit of rhyme. Um, you two can have gone around with your brushes and tar, having pretty much systematically gone down that length of corridor, going along the ceiling, going along the floor, going along the walls. As you've opened up the connecting, or at least the adjoining rooms, you can have all of those surfaces covered. Pretty much the only, the only area that hasn't been covered by tar at this point is that room itself. But the, the outer walls you've covered on all... Besides the outside, you've covered five of the six surfaces of that cuboid space. So do you want to go outside and plaster ones on the windows as well? Yeah, that sure could help. Okay, so yeah, you, you, in which case you cover all six surf exterior surfaces of that wall, uh, that room without having gone inside. So by... By logic of what you've been told about this thing can't pass through surfaces marked with this, in theory, it shouldn't be able to get out of that room, assuming that that's where it will appear when sun uh, when sundown happens. So if you wish to uh, join either Dorothy or do something else, then you can certainly do that. I won't have you just painting crosses for ages because that's that's a bit dull. With our crosses, uh, Torin, didn't, didn't uh, you want to check out the room just to see... 
Yes. So, I mean, when we go up to paint the windows, yeah, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll peek in through the window that's been Definitely. busted open. We're up there anyway with the ladder. <laughs> Might as well look yeah. inside. Okay, so you've got the got the three main parts of the bay window. That window that was forced is still open, but you can see there are big, thick, heavy, almost like blackout curtains on the other side. So you reach in and part them so that you can yep. see inside. Mm -hmm. okay. There's plenty of grey light. I mean, it's still it's drizzling by late morning now. So you're still getting a little damp doing this, but there's enough light coming past you that you can see into the room. This is very different to the other rooms on that corridor. This is not an empty room. This is still furnished. And looking into it, it looks like a bedroom. There's a large four-poster bed, which uh, takes up a large part of what you can see from here. Uh, the interior curtains of it have been open, though, so you can see through it and beyond. There's got the sink of a dip in the middle of the bed where it obviously implied that it was used for a long time in that one particular spot. Um, but there's also a thick layer of dust over the sheets and also over the floor and a few other bits and pieces that you can see in here as well. You can see the door that would have led out to the corridor, the door that shut that hasn't been opened yet, that the note was uh, that the order was pinned to on the other side. That corresponds with where you'd expect to see it. Then there's a big empty patch of wall. And then there's another, say, another patch of empty wall. Then you've got the four poster bed. On the right hand side of the room, there's a wardrobe that looks like it's been opened. And there's clothes that were on hangers, which have been pulled off and they're littered on the floor. There's a desk further along the wall, um, closer along the wall to that, where there's various bits and pieces on there. And then there's a big old chest with a uh, not like a padlock, but like a latch that looks like it was opened, but uh, with a pin that the pin's been dropped and the latch is now open. So you could just lift up the lid if you wanted. As the mentioned, there is plenty of dust in here. You can see evidently signs of footprints on the floor. Uh, there's footprints that look like three figures or three people came in through the window. They went around the bed and then went to the far side of the room, but that's the point when the bed obscures where the footprints go, so you can't see on the floor down that way. But you see two sets of footprints running back, clambering through the window, and then bigger sets of prints chasing them. All right. So from what I understand about, about Revenants, um... That door that's been sealed, that, the door that was sealed off, is there any like, is there a cross hanging on it? What is the, you know, from the inside? There is just a blank wall. There is no, in, there is no sign of any other door other than the one that leads out into the corridor. But because you've looked at the adjoining rooms, where a door should be, there is just blank wall. And so it's covered up. Wall is wallpaper or plaster. Of well, they, they, they plastered over the doors. Or there's... The... Oh, God. Or... It's... They no longer lead here. Like, this isn't a space apart somewhere that the fairies put it. Mm. Like, it's not quite part of this world in a way. Yeah, like there's the there's the inner door, which is the only. So, like, if, if we were to go through this window, it would be almost going into some place other than the castle. No, wherever, wherever. At night, there's another entrance. Mm. This opens up somewhere else. I guess uh, there's, there's, gate there's, there's egress to wherever they tortured Emma, the fairies did at night. So if we're going to find her body, as much as we all hate the fact, the only way to get to her body is if we come here at night. At night, yeah. Which means that perhaps some people are going to have to play a runaround with the Revenant as somebody else sneaks one or two people sneak their way into here and yeah, retrieve the body. Make 
Sneaky sneak McSneakers. Well, and, and all and, our prep is going to be for not if it just goes through the floor or the ceiling in here. Unless we went. Yeah, you, as I said, you've covered yeah. all six sides. Yeah. If you think of this as a cubic room. You, yeah, we, we've, we've covered done all that. six okay, sides. Wanna, all right. What if you forced the Revenant to another room? In other words, you made a corridor where it could go. Right. If we keep it, yeah, that's a good point. So if we keep it permanently trapped in here, we can't get past it. So we need to let it out. We need to let it come out, go into another room to try to find a way out, and then seal it in there. So yeah, we need to make a maze. We need to lead it somewhere else. Yeah. But, but aren't they aren't they they're smart though? They're, they're not smart. Like, they're not like rats that we can just they're lead they're they're, they're smart, but they're 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 full of hate and pissed off. So I think they'll think so getting them permanently stuck somewhere might be tricky, but leading them away from here uh, and then somebody else sneaking up through the window or whatever, somebody else coming through a different way um, to get at the body that would work. So we don't, we don't want to, we don't want it going outside necessarily right off the right off the bat because that um, we have really no control over it but if we move fast it, and if we keep fly. it inside the castle and we let it out into a predefined space that gives us the work okay so we okay with that in mind we will remove straight tar <laughs> we'll give it a way out into the hallway and then expand our little lab like you know, we'll set gotcha. up a... <laughs> you, you've got plenty of options for corridors that come off here further down the further down the corridor, past the area that was uh, boarded up. And you've got all the side rooms that you can play around with. So you have plenty of opportunity to set up a little warren for it to go and explore and then potentially trap it in. That is not a problem. We will do that. We'll prepare my hunter instincts. We'll prepare a trap. <laughs> Gotcha. Good right, thing that, will, that will take a little bit of time. Yep. And say, father's got father's got his crosses. What else would you like to do? Um, I'll, I'm probably going to. Um, hmm. I'm just going to prepare myself for possibly having to use, you know, prayers and stuff to keep this thing at bay. Mm -hmm. okay uh in which case that if you wanted to assign your advantage you could uh use that as a particular bonus to inspiration okay i'll do that then yeah right so that's your advantage if and when if and when you want to cash it in and then two of you heading off to this little apartment so this is about a five block walk from where you are. It's heading roughly southeast towards the train station. Um, this is still got the more run down part of town, but there's, as was mentioned by, uh, by the good father, there is a very different sense of architecture between the east side of the river and the west side of the river. This is the more commercial or business uh, area as well as where people live. So lots of more wooden structures and generally not as high quality or not as affluent as that on the west, the west side of the river. But after having taken a couple of moments of walking down the road, you know, gradually working out, it must be, it's not that building, it's not this one, it must be this one. Uh, you find it's a fairly rectangular, fairly basic structure. There's, it's almost identical to the ones either side of it. The three floors, there's an entrance way, and then there's a couple of uh, fairly rectangular basic living quarters on each floor. And as mentioned, she was on the third floor. You work your way going up one set of stairs, then back along a landing, then up another set of stairs, then back along a landing and up to the top floor. And you find the apartment as, as numbered, door shut. What do you want to do? Uh, so, Dorothea, being a physician and a lady, you might be poised to uh, get into good 
you know, uh, yes. but I can be pretty charming. <laughs> so then we should explain because I don't look professional. Yes. I, mm. I suppose the story we could at least open with is that, you know, we're following up on what happened with her friend and, you know, what did she see, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's very much our doorstep after all. So it is. Yes. <laughs> Why it's not as though we don't have a reason. House. Exactly. Well, I don't, I don't know. They didn't tell us which room she was in. So I suppose we're just going to have to knock. Uh, the, the lad looked to be about 16. About that mid, mid to late teens. So, you know, we're, I assume it's a, it's a, a daughter about to go off into the world. So you, okay. you, you seem smart and I'll make nice. Okay, excellent. Good idea. Start, you know, go. Once we get up there, I suppose mm-hmm. it'll just be knocking on every door till we find her. Yeah, well, there's only the two doors. Oh, so okay. it, well then that works. Yeah, yeah. which you, you knock on the first one and there's a female voice responds that sounds roughly like a teenager, at least a young a young girl anyway. So one, one moment, one moment. And there's a... Uh, Kind of rummaging around sound inside and then footsteps going across the across what sounds like bare wooden floorboards it's a fumbling a latch and then the door opens and a yeah a teenage girl or maybe late teens or maybe early 20s at, uh, at oldest uh, dressed pretty much all in black uh, opens the opens the door up uh, looks between you oh um uh, you're okay. Go. Yeah, well, who? 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 Who are you? Uh, Sophia Ohm. Yeah, you. You don't look like a courier. Like a what? Oh, like, sorry. I, I was expecting. I was expecting someone. My name is Dr. Dorotea Luconan, and this is my associate Oscar Erickson. Um, we live in Castle Gillencreutz. Her eyes um, open a bit wider at that. <laughs> uh-huh. We would like to know your side of the story of the events this morning. We're not oh, here to press charges, Sophia. We just want to know what happened. She she looks a little bit skittish at this. Uh, do you want to give me a manipulation roll? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm not a very empathic person. <laughs> it's all I'm good at. So go ahead and fail and I'll scoop her up. All right. Uh, oh, no. Oh, I actually did get one. Yes. Out of three okay. dice. Woo. Maybe, maybe it's the, the way you've said it. Maybe it's that there's no real hostility in this. As you said, those magic words, no charges. That she she looks a little bit timid, but, uh, well, okay. As long as, uh, as long as I'm not in any trouble or anything, then, uh, yeah. Water okay. under the bridge. Oh, yeah, oh, come, come, come on in, come on in. And she opens the door up a bit wide for you to step on inside. And it's it's a modest apartment to say the uh, to say the most. That there's bare floorboards. There's a single table with a couple of chairs that look like they're maybe even slightly wobbly. Uh, that sat sat next to it, um, over which is a long uh, a long coat which is uh, thrown over one chair. Um, otherwise, it's very basic furnishing. There's a, a rudimentary open plan kitchen off at one end and then a single room that goes off that that looks like it's almost an empty room apart from a bathtub that's just sat in the middle of the uh, middle of the room. The kind of bathtub that you need to bucket water into it because there's no internal water piping here. And then a bedroom where there's pretty much a mattress that's on, on the floor. It's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a hobble. But yep, she closes the door behind you. There's not really any kind of latch, but there is a chair that she has ready to <laughs> wedge under the door handle should uh, should she need to. And yeah, sorry, I've, I can't, uh, not really much places to sit. And I've not got much besides water to offer, but... Uh, That's all right. When you said my side of the story, what, what kind of thing, what kind of thing do you want? Um, start from the beginning. What, what were you doing? What was the purpose of you breaking into our castle? Well, she 
she again looks a little bit furtive. You, you, you're sure I'm not going to get into any trouble for this? Absolutely none at all. Well, um, well, me and my my friends, we we have a little um, a little business that we uh, that we run. We mm -hmm. um, we can procure items for for people, but we, we don't really ask questions as such uh, we we simply we take our instructions and we go and uh, we go and get things for, for folks if you uh if you, you get what i mean uh it's one of the things that attracts certain type of uh, certain types of customer to us that those that don't like questions being asked and well yeah. we had a we had a customer come to us uh she she said she wanted uh, wanted us to go into the uh, into the castle. Um, she showed us or pointed out the particular room that we were supposed to go into, and said that once once we got in there, that we would find there would be uh, some kind of cross nailed to a door in there, and that we was to retrieve retrieve the cross and bring it to her. And in the meantime, if there was anything else in the room that we that we took the fan took fancy to that we could have it, but we weren't to go and go into any other part of the castle because the there were folks living there that they might hear us. So it was supposed to be a quick in and out job. I, she, you can see that her skin starts to turn a little bit pale and her eyes open a bit wide as she thinks back to a particular moment. I got the there was two doors inside inside the room and I, I saw the cross pretty much immediately got nailed the four four nails that were holding it in place on the door you just had to pull them out and then the, the cross came out and the, the others leaf and pear were were looking through some of the like the clothes in the wardrobe and there was this big old case full of junk that uh that leaf was having a look at and then as soon as that as soon as that cross came off the door that that thing came out came out of the dark came out of that the door grab leaf and just dragged him folding him up like paper and running off with him into the dark we we turned and ran what i i don't i don't know what what we what we've got involved with but i don't want anything anything more to do with it i mean, I, was, I was supposed to be meeting with the with the woman that gave me the kind of gave me the job this morning but she, i got a note saying that she was sending she was sending a courier instead that she wasn't able she wasn't going to be able to meet up but she mm. had something for me yes uh we'll need to get uh, her information because that woman if she was even born of man set you up very cruelly to have this uh happen to you you didn't see what the thing did to leave it folded him up. I mean, we heard the bone we bones break. We heard it. Did it? Cry. But then it also it pursued you in pair. Yeah, it ran back with him into the into the into that corridor that just this dark corridor that went off into the distance. And we we, we managed me and pair managed to get out down the down the the the, the, the drain. Back pipe. down the drain. Yeah. Yeah, uh, as we were running, I managed to climb the fence, and just as he was coming over, that thing bounded out through the out of the dark and grabbed him and pulled him back. And then I just heard this squish, and he was the next thing I heard him was he was on the he couldn't even scream; he was just no, impaled. Yeah, no, it's it, it, I, I'm sure he died more quickly than it seemed. Uh, what's what's what was what is Leaf's last name? Uh, Leaf at Almgren. Hungren, okay. Um, I mean, not that anything can be done for him, but it'll help perhaps with our completing the investigation. Is, is, uh, this, thing, is this thing going to come after me because I've still got that cross? I think actually the cross, the cross was keeping it inside that room, and that's why you were tricked into going there to remove it. Mm. I think you want to wear a cross. I don't think you have to destroy it, but I think you you might not want to keep it on your person either. But I, if you you know, if you go to a, if you want to see a priest and 
get something for your own protection, it's not a bad idea because it might know it might know that you saw it. Well, she well, she goes she goes over to that long coat that she's got uh, thrown over one of the chairs and kind of flicks it round and dives into what would otherwise be a normally fairly concealed hidden interior pocket. And she pulls out this cross that's about like that by like that. So it's almost about a foot tall by three quarters of uh, a foot across. And about a hundred years old. It's, it's a nice piece of work, actually. It's made of solid silver and it's mm. inlaid with, it's inlaid with gems at various, at various points. So yeah, this there's also four faint marks or scratches around where the or the two bars meet that would imply where it, some nails have been driven into wood and then been bent around it so that it would hold it in place. It's all in place. Mm -hmm. uh, this this might be the most effective thing to keep that monster back where it came from. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she she's got nodding. I I just I don't want to, I don't want to see that thing again. Oh, no. Understandable. Um, outside, you can hear the sound of uh, footsteps coming up the coming up the stairs. Carpets, I suppose. Who are you? Ex you said you were expecting someone, Sophia. Yeah, I, I, I got a note come through the door uh, that was saying about that. Uh, so the Alva wouldn't wasn't able to make it. That she said that she was sending a, a courier with something right. for me in, in her place. I, pre, right. I presume payment. Mm, yeah, Alva. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Sophie. Why didn't you get? She got a wardrobe to hide behind or something. Yeah, well, there's an, there's two adjoining rooms that because it's a fairly small place. All right, Dorothea and I. Maybe we should uh, both sides of the door. Yes, because yeah. this is a villain coming. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, you you position yourself either side of the door, and there's a knock, 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 and a again probably a mid-teen uh, boy's voice. There's a package for a uh, Miss Orr. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like seventeen. From whom? Oh, yeah, I've got a, got a package for a missile. Who sent it? Ah, I, I don't know. I've just been just told where to deliver these. Leave it at the door. Okay. Oh, you can kind of hear this kind of muttering. Guess I'm not getting a tip. Mutter, mutter, mutter. <laughs> the, the boy promptly, you can hear a, uh, you can hear the, a box or something being put down outside. And then voice wander uh, well, again, mutters away, going, ah, oh, cheap skates, you know, and stomping down the stairs. It's the third floor. So if it gets down two floors and we open the door and it's not a bomb, then I'm going to toss a copper down the stairs <laughs> for the poor lad. Well, now that, you mentioned, the, now that you mentioned the B word, give me a, a, give me a vigilance roll. Both of us are yeah. just him. You're both close enough. You might hear okay. it. Oh boy. That's five dice for me. Just one success from five dice. Two, Two successes. Oh, okay. yeah. Right. In which case, uh, both of you hear the ticking. Um, but there's a box roughly the shape, uh, roughly the size of what would be the equivalent of a modern shoe box with a very definite tick, tick, tick. Tick, 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 tick of what could be a small carriage clock or an alarm clock inside. Um, with uh, Dorothea's extra success, you notice that it's wrapped in brown paper with string going around it. But there's a note and then a wax seal at the end. Um, the wax seal is a stylized letter R. And it just says, with thanks, the Rosenbergers. And that's a definite re realized ticking. Okay, uh, get Sophia like run into a room, shut the door. I don't, I don't know how big of a bomb this is. That, that's what I'm doing. I don't know if Oscar's doing anything differently. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm grabbing the girl and like running into a room and shutting the door. Okay. Stuff on mute. We stuffed her behind the armoire. Um, if it's if it's actually ticking, mm -hmm. uh, I'm. So we're in the third floor. Is there an, are there stairs to an attic or a roof door? 
or is this the very top? There's a hatch which would presumably go out to the attic or. But the there's room. not. There's not a stairwell. No. Um. But the yeah, so. Yeah, I'm just running into the bathroom. I've, I've grabbed <laughs> Sophia. We're running. Okay, shutting well, the that's, door. That's fine. I'm. I can. I will set your difficulty accordingly. Okay. Um, so it looks like Oscar's wandering and maybe may, is on the verge of spending a little bit too much time wondering what to do. Yeah, I. I think it has to go out of the street. I'm going to grab it and rush through the apartment to throw it out the window because I think in the building it might not be okay. Okay, so Dorothea and he's got rushing back away from the direction that Oscar's running, and Oscar's trying to throw it out the window. Uh, we will go for a the name of the skill now. It's going to be an agility roll for uh, Dorothea. Okay. So your agility oh, no. plus physique, and it's going to be precision and ranged combat for Oscar. To throw this, uh, to effectively launch this thing out of the window. I'm cashing in my advantage now because I have very <laughs> poor physique. I'm not a <laughs> physical person. <laughs> Two successes. Yes. Oh, okay. That's pretty good. And what does Oscar get? One success. Right. That's the main thing that you need to launch it out of the way. You throw it through the window as, as as fast as you can, and as it soars out above the street, it goes off in midair. There is an almighty boom. The windows on the front of the building shatter. Um, you are forced back by the blast, whereas Dorothea has uh, two walls, effectively, between her and the explosion. The door into the apartment gets blown off its hinges. Um, you need to, uh, effectively going to do two point uh, two damage, so uh, two conditions to you. Dorothea gets enough to cancel both of them out. Oscar cancels one of them, so you do pick up one physical condition of your choice as you are effectively thrown back by the force of the blast and smash into one of the interior walls and then end up crumpled in a heap on the floor. Uh, I The way I uh, imagined... What you know, my indecisive panic like shoebox, stairwell, shoebox, ticking, mm -hmm. apartment. I think that I sort of ran through the apartment and thrust it forward. Uh, so I might have missed some of the direct blast, but I just smashed my face in mm -hmm. because I didn't, you know, there was a way to protect that. So that's the kind of injury that I've taken. I've you know, damaged my nose, maybe snapped a tooth. So it so, sounds like you're a bit battered or wounded. Yeah. One of those two. Yeah, indeed. There, there are indeed some days you just can't get rid of a bomb in time. But yeah, outside you hear there's screams, there's uh, people running, there's commotion, there's yelling, and pandemonium just seems to be breaking out on the street outside. Um, you can hear people in the apartments downstairs. They're crying, some in pain, but obviously not to major pain. But definitely, there is there are people hurt down there. But yeah, if that had uh, if that had gone off inside the building, that would have been a hell of a lot worse, especially for you, pretty much being at ground zero. Yeah. You reckon that was a yeah a, a fair number of a bundle of various sticks of dynamite with a with a timer. Good job, Oscar. Good. Uh... It, you oh god you look terrible I, yeah, I I, i'll patch you up back at back at the house can you walk uh yeah it's mostly up here we have we should move the girl yes oh rosenbergs i was just reading about them in the library poor rosenbergs rosenbergers there, there was a schism in the society years ago and they branched off and created their own vassin studying group and there's there's been a history of violent conflict between us and them ever since somebody knows what is happening somebody else let's let's get out of here let's get the girl let's get out of here and then i can patch you up at home mm -hmm. Are you, so are you taking uh, Sophia with you? 
yet. I don't know that we're going to take her to the castle, but at least away from this building. I don't, I, I'm but afraid if, they're going to come back for her or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're, well, depending, if you're willing to let her go, as soon as she gets outside, she's quite happy to just run as fast as her li- uh, little legs will carry her in any direction. I don't know that we should ask her. I don't know that we should let, let her go. What if they come back after her? I mean, I, if, if we don't let her go, like we walk out of the street, I'm all bloody. There's char here. We've all got bits of plaster. And she starts to tug away. Sophia, like we're not trying to kill you and somebody else is. So why, where do you want to go? I was planning on getting on, the, getting on a train and getting the hell out of here. Just getting as far away from here as quick as I can. If you can afford to go, I'll give so, her some. Money. I'm a doctor. I've got money. I'll give. I'll press some money into her hand. Yeah. She, Get away she from read, here. Yeah, she takes it and just says, "Yeah, you, you, you look after yourselves as well." But I'm gonna go somewhere where even I haven't been before. If I don't know where I'm going, they won't. If you, oh, where's yeah, where's the cross? Do we have the cross? Yeah, you. Oh, she had it okay. out. So yeah, she she kind of you know, not throws it at you, but definitely. Like, you give her money in one hand, she gives you the cross with the other and says, take the, exactly. take the damn thing, I don't want it. If you find yourself ever coming across something that makes me, makes you feel as you did in that confrontation at the castle, you know where to find us. Also, where were you supposed to be, Matt, who was going to come and pay you? Uh, Alva. Uh, Alva Lampinen. Tell- Tell me about Alva Lampinen because she's the one who sent you up to die. Well, she, she said she was, so she just had this job for us. That's the point we didn't ask questions because that's that's how we, kind of a, our selling point. That's how we get customers. Yeah. She just said she wanted the cross, and that she said she was going to meet us here for payment today. And that yeah, then I just got this note when I came back and said, no, I'll, I'll send it by by courier. Yeah. So courier was death. Payment was death. How do you? How would you otherwise find Alva Lampinen? She found us. You did. Did you meet her in a bar at a train station? How did at, you ever? At the train station. Uh huh. What does she look like? Uh, she gives a description of someone that could almost be every woman or like every man. That's fairly average height, fairly fairly slender build, long black hair normal complexion yeah it honestly could be could account for a good 50 percent of the people you've got out on the street which are kind of gawping at the remains of the bomb or the the explosion having gone off in midair of course and when and uh when you say that she found you and then it's a you know began to suggest jobs that you could do you never went to a place other than the train station to meet her or no, she, she, associates of hers she came in on a train she went uh, she went out on a train 28 32 uh, came 36. up from came up from stockholm headed north right all right we need oscar you need tending to and i don't want to be yeah, around when true. the police come by Constable seeing us after having just dealt with us this morning, not a great look. Mm-hmm. You, you can indeed hear whistles uh, being blown in the distance uh, that are coming closer. Yeah, we need to relay this to the to the group as well. All right, back at the castle. Sounds like you've uh, got your little maze set up and you've... Uh, Looking at the notes uh, in the chat, you're setting up partial crosses. So all you need to do is do a quick flick and then yep. you've, yeah, good plan. So you're all set with the most optimal way to close close her in into a particular room. Yeah, to give her the run around and then isolate her away from the fairy chamber. <laughs> Gotcha. Yep, you can have that all set up by the time the others uh, by the others get back. Likewise, say your father is uh, already and spiritually spiritually fortified for uh, doing battle later, and say it's probably going to be about one two o'clock in the afternoon, having gone across town, come back again, done the bits of the mound. So yeah, we'll we'll say that it's about 
one o'clock that you can all be back together and have shared exploits. So, uh, glad you're not dead. Um, that's a. Uh... You're very sweet that we're torn. <laughs> the the Rosenbergers they must just be in it to cause trouble for us. I mean, they must. I mean, when there's the schism that you said that you read about, I mean, they must have known that the revenant was here, and they must have heard that somebody else has moved back in and decided to try to kill us by exactly. a revenant. Yeah, the the accounts I said I read were violent confrontations were common. No, I mean, I, I can't say I'm, I'm uh, against committing violence back on them if I ever meet one. Uh, I don't appreciate it when people try to kill me and my friends. I'm going to um, uh, have uh, a, a fairly high tot of brandy um, because this this particular patch hurts. Uh, and I'm going to look in the library about uh, anything regarding Alva Lampanen or any other Lampanen because I don't understand the coordination over a hundred years. When was this, how long ago was the schism between the different parts? It doesn't say this, the, the history of the society notes, um, I, I guess it, it's not like a specific year, Matt. It didn't, yeah, it just kind of said, yeah. It's, it's, this, it's an it, ideological split that happened over a while. Yeah, and it was, it was all about how to interact with that basin and how we get our information. Some believed we needed to live amongst them and marry them and some, you know, wanted to use them. witchcraft. Yeah, one of them, they took, it doesn't say which, if it was the Rosenbergers or not. It, it, there's an implication that there were many schisms and many factions, but one of them, the leader married a basin and they, that's that they believed that to live amongst the basin was the way to learn about them. I don't know. Uh, Oscar, do you need uh, medical treatment? I wouldn't object. Yes, let me let me look after you, Oscar. Is that just a medicine roll or? Oh, the medicine roll would for having just the one condition would take a, uh, would take pretty much a day of healing. Oh, um, it's only really until they get broken that you can start administering medicine as almost like a first aid roll. Um, uh, but with um, with a good look over him, and uh, your professional diagnosis would be if he has uh, pays a visit to the gymnasium, then that would be. Mechanically, a way to eliminate one con one physical condition. Yes, to get rid of all the go glass in your face. Go work <laughs> out for a little. Go, bit. go walk it off. Literally. It's actually mostly splinters, <laughs> and I guess they've got some good bomb in there. Yeah, Maybe so you go to the library. Just walk it off. I'm gonna go yeah. to the gym and uh, use the mirror and the. You were only minorly exploded. Just suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Tough it out. Um, was there a Lampanen that signed the order to seal it away? Uh, the three names no. on the order were Grauers, Frisk, and Larson. Oh, so yeah, Larson, it has an L in common, but no, not the uh, right. the same name. Wanted to make sure because there was something that was... That was were, there, the, uh, the were there any previous records in the library for the society that was here before us? Yeah, there's the, the society was previously known as the Order of Artemis. So it has records that go back way back over 150, well, nearly 200 years. I'll go check and see if there's rosters of members and mm -hmm. see if there's a lamp in. Yeah. There's nothing that crops up going back, but the thing that will become obvious quite quickly is that there is still that 10 year gap that, you know, that 10 years ago, the society ended, uh, stopped or came to a halt here. Right. No records in that period. So it's possible that this Lampanen character came into prominence or joined the Rosenbergers or whatever happened may have happened in that 10 year, that 10 year period. And also they are a rival faction that your, your, your society here may not have particularly in-depth uh, knowledge about its enemies. Rosenberg well, himself was a founding member of our society. And it's then an schism. Interesting cross. I wonder if it's more significant than just they wanted to release the thing. While you are pondering, there is another bang, bang, bang at the door. Uh, was it a bomb for us personally? <laughs> I'll go check with the dog. <laughs> I'll, I'll come down at a distance. 
Okay, the, the two of you head to head to the door. Um, particularly, uh, your dog. Just before you open the door, there's a kind of contented, happy yapping, as it's uh, you re- you know your body language of your uh, mm-hmm. of your faithful canine friend recognizes the scent of whoever's whoever's out there, and is All happy. Right. And you open up the door, and there's Detective Carell stood there. Ah, hello again. Glad, uh, glad to uh, catch that you're still here. Uh, I was wondering, did I leave my notebook here? Uh, I, I don't know. Well, let's see. You were sitting over here. Is he? Um, is he all right? Oh, she. She. Yeah. Yeah. Is she just. She's kind of looking and maybe a little bit absent-minded. Uh, but is everything... also, you, you do notice actually that uh, her hair is slightly more ruffled, and that there's almost like a little abrasion or scratch on her forehead. Uh, are you are you feeling okay? Uh, yeah, just just a little shaken up. That was all. Uh, some um, some lady bumped into me. Uh, not too uh, not too long after I left here a couple of hours a few hours ago and i was i was just going and heading back to the station to uh, to write up my notes and i realized I, I must have left the left my notebook here a, a lady um describe the lady the description matches the one that sophia gave you of alva hey can mm. the uh can my dog friend pick up a new scent? Or I mean, this is hours ago. It's probably not gonna. Yeah, you. And there's no way it's her. Wind she and didn't, rain she out. She doesn't have streets. something of her anyway. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if the lady lifted them off of. Hmm. I, I did deliberately uh, describe that she put her notebook in her outer pocket of her long coat. Yeah. That was when you last saw her with it. No, you. I. Whoever did it, I think, uh, has your notebook. Oh, she she kind of looks angry at herself. Great pickpockets. Oh, what would they want? What would they want with my notebook? All it all it had was the discussions of everything about what we talked about. So, saying well, how many people were in the castle, your names, numbers, what you're doing here. Yeah, yeah. That is, it's it's odd that somebody would want to know so much about us. <sighs> Well, looks like I'm going to have to go and report that to the uh, to the constable. See if we can get uh, see if we can catch this uh, little pickpocket. Oh, sorry to bother you again. And she uh, right, right. turns around and starts heading out. So while I'm picking bits of wood out of my face in the bathroom, no one says there was an explosion. Twenty blocks from here. That at all. I, I, don't I don't want. want I don't want that tied to us. Yeah. <laughs> Just because <laughs> you punted it out the window. It was a good call. <laughs> yeah, you, you do hear, eventually. You do hear the chef muttering about, "Oh, Al has been uh, trying to clear the drains again." That's probably what that uh, what that boom was. I heard. Thinking it's not it's not James Bond. You probably could have opened the box up and just pulled the wires out. It wouldn't have gone off. Well, you know, hindsight, uh, Father, is twenty twenty, and uh, <laughs> when there's a bomb in front of you, you might react it with a little more panic and urgency. <laughs> Put it in the uh, bathtub and filled it with water. But I mean, telling her that we know of, of a bomb explosion at somebody who had broken into her house. It, and people who have died, like there are people who got were killed on our property after breaking into our house, and then we go to their house and then blow that person up. I'm it, actually it's surprised. Not that, so hot. <laughs> I'm surprised that she didn't say something about it. That was no. What? I think I think she got I think she got hit over the head, and was just robbed, and it still has still coming out of it. I don't I don't think it was a light that rushing was hours past ago. In the street. Yeah, I mean, she could be uh, been phased in a park somewhere in between here and the police station. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if the body of that other boy is somewhere in this house. Well, yeah. he was. You said he 
was folded Just up folded and brought up. into the dark corridor. I think he was brought into the, the inner fairies. vault of the fairy ah, room. You're right. Yeah. You're right. So he would only be able to find that at night. Is it worth... I'm inclined to think no, but I want everyone's opinion. Is it worth trying to finish what the Revenant started and see if Emma's body is there? I'm concerned. I don't want to disturb the fairies, but we need the body. Yes, if it's there. Well, what did, we the, have what the, did the records have... say? Did they say that they buried the body back there? Oh, it says that they took it away into nowhere. It's never nowhere. Away. Okay, then yeah, no, I can't it's... see the fairies properly burying her or anything like that. I okay. think uh, having the cross back. I mean, the door that it was nailed to no longer exists or won't exist for another couple of hours again. If I got the right impression, it was the door into the fairy chamber that the cross was blocking. Yep. Mm -hmm. We might want to put that back. The problem is, I mean, again, we'll be, you know, playing run around with the horrifying monster uh, during the night. But whoever goes, whoever sneaks their way in to find the body on their way out might want to... Or at some point, we might want to refashion the cross there after the Revenant's dealt with. Well, you're we talking now about getting her back in there. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do that. No, 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 no. Seal I'm her saying, up in some other room. No, I no. That's that's what I mean. I'm saying after this is all said and done, after we've dealt with the Revenant, we it may behoove us to put that cross. I see. Back on the oh. fairy door. <laughs> I don't think that's totally, going to stop totally the good. fairies from coming to see us or anything, though. Still, still, I don't know, but regardless, it's iron, yes, not silver. Anyway, oh, that's true. Um, well, the uh, the the cross is silver and the nails were iron, I believe. Oh, steel. okay, I see. Not that that necessarily is the key. My concern, you know, and as I say this, like my face is covered with bits of plaster and blood of <laughs> all the splinters, and my nose is like right here. Um, my concern is that they've got an agent. It's acting in the world. <clears throat> yeah. Like, who is this woman who inspired these kids? Who's the woman? Right. Like, how do they have somebody acting? And, and she's not going to go away when we seal the house up if we can. Yeah, she'll records, keep on trying to, to break. The records state that the society has no idea where their headquarters are, but that their numbers are growing. That they, they increase think... presence. We, we don't have we don't have the time to track this person down. Right. Yeah, this we is, have to yeah. we have to permanently deal with the revenant. We can't just seal it up somewhere because they'll let it loose again, and we have to do this all all over again. We have to kill the revenant, so and we then we can work on trying to find this. We trap it in another room while we go in and get the body. I I think some people need to give it the runaround in the house while other people simultaneously go after the body. Well, then let's let's determine who's to task for that so we're not running around <clears throat> like chickens with our heads cut off in the moment. I can bless whoever is in the most risk, but Revenant can move quickly, so be careful. I am I am not fleet of foot, so I do not believe I should be the one to get How do chased. we know how fleet of foot we actually are? Is that just agility? Agility, I'm assuming. Yep. Okay. I have I have a high physique and I have good agility i have good stealth i have good combat i have yeah. some st- i have i actually have good stealth myself i, I, I would be know. willing to sneak into the room yeah i think i think with my propensity to run around like to evade to be stealthy and evade it uh, in a chase might be better that way than the st- but I mean, also with the stealth. I mean, going in with whoever is also going in in a pair. I don't. I don't know. Father's right, though. If we, if it gives chase to us, and we are not physically fit, we could die. And then, I want it known now. If I die in this battle, I'm counting on you all to make sure I don't come back. We believe, Father, that uh, a thorough fire prevents these sorts of things. A thorough fire? Yeah. If we burn the corpse completely, it can't can't return. 
That's, first. That's true. I'm checking with you because, frankly, you know, in my corner of the forest, we have different traditions. Well, that usually does it. Um, I've always believed it needs a Christian burial, but... But in terms of not being able to do whatever Emma is doing, which we think is the case, right? That's our universal assumption that this is angry Emma. Oh, yes. Um... Well, I don't know how we've re- fig- figured this out, but I um, once we get it into a room, we can hang a cross on the door so that it can't come back out. Well, here's the problem that I think is worth worth noting. The text said that putting a cross on the surface prevents it from traveling incorporeally through the surface. It can go physical as well. It might just batter the door down or it could be perfectly trapped. I don't know, but I can't, I don't think we can a hundred percent bank on it. Like it's not a hang the cross on the door and then just sink down in relief. It's a hang across on the door and keep running like hell. <laughs> Isn't there why, any... why didn't it get out before? Well, that's a good point. I don't know. Is there anything in the texts that show what can maybe keep it from changing forms? Mm. Anything that referenced that at all? And likewise, what, what is, what's the deal with the foot shape? Like it's a clawed, long, triangular foot. So, is that a thing that happens when angry dead revive, or is that a specific form that has a meaning? It's a monster. Because the father got two successes, which is a pretty good deal on the initial learning check to learn about the revenants. The main on a weakness it has the main thing about it going incorporeal or being physical is it can only hurt you and only do damage to physical items when it or physical objects when it is physical if it's threatened it can go incorporeal which effectively is ha ha you can't hit me but it can't hit anyone either so if you do put, pose a threat to it it can go incorporeal and basically go yeah you, you can't hit me but i can't hit you either Normal weapons will they hurt the thing? They, be... they will potentially you could potentially hold it off by doing uh, by threatening it with physical damage, but killing it maybe uh, the only way to physically do it would be to destroy its body. Here's another concern: Are we going to incur the wrath of the fairies if we destroy this thing that they've been playing with we for the last we century? Can't, we can't worry about about that at the minute. I mean this. So the thing is going to kill us if we don't deal with it, or it's going to be a massive well, I, pain. I, my other point then is, I don't know, maybe this is a terrible idea. Do we enlist the help of the fairies? This is like, this is their end of the thing too. And say, you know, that we have this thing, it's been, it's escaped. It's well, you might have to bargain with them when you go through that door. I just, I, I, I worry that when we kill it, we're going to have another enemy of the fairies because it's theirs. Emma is theirs. I, I don't. I, I, let's I, let's I, let, let's consider that we have to live here in Castle Chillencruz. Yes. And there are fairies living in the mounds. Yes. We need to strike some sort of bargain with them, Lord, yes. so that we can coexist. That's what we would much rather do than have them as our enemies. Oh, exactly. Think, we don't want a war. We we want to be but, in unison. Here. How how does one strike up a a conversation with the fairies? At, at I don't know. Point? I think we might have one tonight if you go through that door to get the body. I would. We I might mean, have to offer them gifts or could peace we have, offerings or. It, we still have a few hours. Maybe I. I'd like to look up fairies and, and see yeah, what, what the what fairies I want. Yes. Dealing with fairies, how to contact them, et cetera. If we can get a hold of them before nightfall, we might end up having some help. Yeah. That's a learning role. I like okay. that. Sometimes all they want is cupcakes. <laughs> can, can we all go to the library for this? Yeah. You, you can all, all hit the books. All right. I'll help as little as I can. That's this is logic. learning. Learning. Yep. Learning logic. Got it. 
with my pitiful three dice, I actually got a success. I didn't find anything. I got one success as well. Okay. Any advance on one? Just the one. Okay, so three of you have got... Did Sauron get anything? About zero. Five, 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 one. You're, you're, you're looking in the same place as the, as the father. Well, it seems like the, uh, the other three have found the particular shelf that is all about the, uh, the fair folk. And there's, there's various different uh, bits and pieces you're coming across. That Offerings are things like milk, cream, uh, foods. Also, politeness and respect will get you a long way as well. Um, in terms of establishing contact... Open up the um, open up the mound, or call them out. Very well. So you yeah, it's, you go. Yeah, but that's not polite to open up that mound. That'll piss them off. Well, don't open it up. Call yeah, them out. Call them out. And bring yeah, some I th- offerings. I, I think I think we should bring up a, a jug of uh, cream, and and sing sweetly. Because yeah. they might, because I, I think that they are not going to like all of uh, Lampening either. And if we could really use support. Well, That's my I, guess. I, I agree. I completely agree. Um, Oscar, I do not have your silver tongue. I, I will support you physically, but I am not going to be talking to any fairy. Well, apparently I'm going to need to be sewn back together periodically. So... <laughs> We, we have I a tip. Let's get Chef to make some cookies and yeah. some sweetbreads. Yes. Are, yes. Well, sweetbreads. <laughs> or, or some, some, some nice. Some cardamom buns. Oh, you just yeah. mean sweetbreads. You don't mean sweetbreads. <laughs> you mean brains and aspect? I'm and sure they. Testicles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 want, I want rich creamery butter. I want the, the extra fat stuff. Good problem. Very pale and cool. No cold iron. No iron. Make sure you right. yeah. have anything like that. Leave it behind. No, it's true. I'll uh, I'll bring my uh, staff, but not my crowbar, so that I don't offend. Okay, so you are gathering stuff from the chef, deliberately ditching certain pieces of equipment, and then heading out to the mound. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, but getting the stuff from the uh, from the chef and having a uh, bake up some stuff probably doesn't take too long. So by about two o'clock, you're out by the mound, and after having done a little cir- uh, circuit around it, you do find that towards the back there is what could almost be thought of as maybe like a little rabbit hole mm. that leads leads into the base of it. Right, not very big, but also it's it's. It can't be actually a rodent hole because it's all grass. There's no brown tunnel. That's that's uh, yeah. We should set up a little little tray or something. We don't want yeah. it to get dirty. A board, a nice board. A yeah. non-iron tray. Mm-hmm. No. A piece of <laughs> a piece of fallen wood, ap- apple wood or cherry, something nice. How is a lot of cheese. How is everybody singing? <laughs> or yeah, you're the most gifted that. here, Father. <laughs> what is that under? Is that manipulation, empathy, or wait a minute? I wouldn't try to out manipulate a fairy, to be honest. Yeah, I think I no we sing, sing them some sweet little song and then I ask them to come out. Fairies, come out. Well, okay. wait, more on the lines of inspiration, I'd say. Got it. Well, I've know- got my my. Uh, Advantage was on the inspiration. I have some fine wine. I don't know if they would like that or not, but I, I, I'm a te- I, I don't think, I don't know. Um, I actually end up with two, four, eight dice. Wow. If I do the inspiration, if if I could do backup singing for <laughs> a bonus die, maybe. And I could actually add one more point to that if I play my fiddle mm-hmm. while I'm doing it. Do you think that those people like fiddles? Do a little Irish jig or I'm just gonna, Scandinavian I'm just gonna, jig? 
hold the cheese board and look I'll friendly. I will look stoically on from a distance. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'll drop a sick feet for backing up the father. So, just having a look at the definition of inspiration. And does it include six beats? <laughs> yeah, you, you get to beatbox with uh, five successes on it. No, the, um, getting extra successes doesn't give you any other mechanical advantage or like some certain other skills. So it's just you do it really well if you get multiple successes. So if you wish to try and sing and play your instrument and while the others provide moral support, give me a roll. <laughs> Holy shit. I got one six out of nine dice. About right. yeah, that's, that's better than me normally. <laughs> <laughs> I have to roll like 20 before I get anything. It was all about the funky beats. That's I was really hoping for like through. six sixes. <laughs> <laughs> so my singing's not so great. but True, but uh, with persistence... Finally, that as you're as you're sat there watching uh, watching the plate and thinking, is is this actually working? Are, is there anything in there at all? And maybe as your uh, moral support maybe starts to flag slightly and begin to question, is this really such a good idea? You see movement from the entrance to that hole, and tentatively stepping out into the light is this little figure that's about yay tall. Uh, wings, almost like a butterfly or a dragonfly, almost slightly translucent, coming off her back, dressed in what looks almost like the world's smallest suit of armor, carrying uh, carrying a sword. This yeah, this figure comes forward, out into the out into the light and looks up at uh, looks up at you, and raises a raises a hand in almost like welcome or acknowledgement. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, hello. We uh, we don't often have visitors. Is this a is, is this an offering for for the queen? Indeed, Indeed. we yes. we uh, we hope for a parley with Queen Miadrama. Ah. Well, I'm uh, I'm part of her personal guard. I'll uh, I'll inform inform the queen that an audience is requested. We're honored to meet you, and thank you for your assistance. Oh, I'm I'm but a, a lonely soul, lonely soldier. Uh, I don't don't command awe in that respect. <laughs> but yeah, please, please 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 wait here. I shall I shall return. And she turns uh, around. The little wings float flittering. Remember, she's a queen. So mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Also. Just that are scary and and crazy, but they're real. So, okay. <laughs> okay. She descends back into the hole, and a couple of minutes pass, and then there's this buzzing sound that starts to come from the hole, and swiftly emerging are four of these other armored, uh, small fairy-like figures, wings buzzing, as between them they are carrying a, a litter, so like a throne with uh, poles on either side, and sat upon this throne is, admittedly still while she's pretty small, what one, once you think would have been a beautiful a beautiful woman if she'd been of normal, normal stature, but instead there's this scarred almost hairless figure that's sat upon this throne, uh, still wearing armour herself, void of wings, unlike her, say, the fairies around her, she has none. But she is carried forward and hovers in the air about three or four foot off the ground. They go swoop up so they can get something more easy to look look upon rather than having to bend down and look and this this voice carries please please rise I, it's been a long long time since we've had visitors uh, please what what brings you what brings you here 
Uh, Your Highness, thank you for this audience. Uh, we have come uh, not to disturb you, but because we fear that there has been an interruption between matters uh, in your realm and ours. Uh, does the name Emma Borkvist mean anything to you? There's a, almost like a twitch and a scowl that comes across her face momentarily. We, we are aware of uh, our pet, yes. It, it seems to have um, been released. Is that possible? Released. Uh, you can see the uh, the royal guard around her. There's a quick few uh, glancing looks at their counterparts on each side of the the litter, and looks of worry go between them. Then the uh, the queen herself looks looks back up and it's it's in in theory possible that that our pet could have escaped, but she's been in there for a long, long time. So this so, couldn't, be, couldn't be herself that escaped on her own volition, surely. It's a revenant, your majesty. Yes. I believe it that's the, the word that you assigned to it. Um, uh, the room in the castle that was meant to keep it imprisoned has been violated, not by us, but by someone trying to cause problems. We are attempting tonight to return the thing. Mm. Or destroy it. Don't you, you believe it's still, still inside? We don't know. Uh, we don't know. We know that it's, it's, it's um, capable of killing mortal creatures. And we know that it was released with the intention of something called Alva Lampanen. Does that name mean anything? Shrugs. Human names. I've, I've certainly not met, met anyone that's given their name and had that name. We have attempted to set a trap for it in the house, but... In order to destroy it, we need the body. Would you be willing to parley with us on what we could do? We certainly want to be friends with you. We are the new residents of the castle. Oh, um, uh, so we are. We are neighbors. <laughs> indeed, and we wish to show you all the respect and tribute you desire. But we also need the body. We want to enter the, the place where it is and remove it, if you will allow, so that we can destroy it. So you are offering to destroy our pet, which is now able to leave its, pris its prison. You if don't... Go on, Father. We don't wish to deprive you of uh, your satisfaction for what that human did to you. What it did is unspeakable to us. We simply want to destroy the thing that's attacking and killing people here. Perhaps if, if you would rather keep her as a pet we could work together to bring it back to your realm and, and, and close it or back seal there, it seal it up again. The, the, the enemy that wants to cause disruption uh, to all of us though, knows of its current prison yes. and will likely disrupt the prison again. If, if it's put back where it is now, if you wish her return to you, we, we would happily help you with that. We just, she should be moved. You can see her evidently contemplating. She looks down, she crosses her, or blinks her fingers together, rests them on her chin.
my concern here is that you say there is some some other party this uh this one that deliberately released her and that's, that, my, that's my understanding yes if we were to just put her back in her prison as you say there's they've already found one way to get her out we might not be so fortunate next time and that she might complete her job of she turns and looks back up the mound digging her way into our home I would be very grateful to take you up on your offer if you wish to remove her and destroy her. It's, it's unfortunate that only, only 150 years of torment could be enacted upon her, but I'd rather have it be 150 rather than her then being able to get at least a few minutes of satisfaction getting to us the the easiest way for you to get to her would be to go through the door to nowhere when it manifests after the sun drops beneath the horizon if you are planning on entering nowhere you will need a guide otherwise you will run into the same trap that has kept her occupied for the last 150 of your years uh, she call, uh, gestures to one of the fairies that's holding up the, the back of the litter and she raises a small trumpet, up, yay big, and just blows a quick and another figure in armour uh, flies out from the hole in the ground uh, with her arms wrapped around because in, in relation to her it's pretty big but in relation to you it's still pretty small. Um, she's carrying a small glass vial with a little cork stopper uh, put into the top. And inside is what for a second looks like a dead fly. But as she holds it, you realise the fly twitches and it moves slightly inside and its uh, rear lights up. It's a little firefly. And the queen gestures... The fly will be able to guide you. Just ask where you wish to w wish it to show you the way to. If you wish to go to her resting place, then just ask of it. If you wish to find your way out of nowhere, just ask of it. Um, I only ask that please return return it to us once you are once you are done and your task is completed. Ah, uh, we appreciate your assistance, Your Highness. Go on, Doran. I, I, I will, I will protect it with my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. And this uh, poor struggling little uh, little royal guard fairy comes over to you and just lets go of the vial once it's over your palm, and then with evident look of relief as she's no longer carrying a weight several times her size, um, starts heading back towards the towards the tunnel into the mound. And the fair, the, the queen, is like nods towards you and says, "I will." I will be here eagerly awaiting report of your success in the morning. Thank you. Any and thanks. The, the litter turns, descends, and heads back into the hole. This is why I am a follower of the writings of the German Karl Marx. <laughs> this whole system is corrupt said once she's out of earshot <laughs> quite <laughs> alright so we now have a better so, chance of success now some of us occupy her while some of us go into nowhere and attempt to retrieve her body is that the plan then that, so. that, that is that is the plan uh i think i would like to go into nowhere because i want to wait at the body if it does return i can help protect whoever's with me with my rifle i can at least make it think twice before 
materializing after us because once we're down in that tunnel and nowhere, I don't think we'll have any room to to maneuver. So there should definitely be some of the armed uh, going that route in case our diversion doesn't pan out. Not I, I'll stay with the diversion. I have a revolver. If if it does change into the physical, I can d- hopefully deter it so it stays ghost. I will, I'll also stay at the diver- as a diversion with the crosses. And um, let's uh, say, uh, let's uh, have a uh, Oh, we don't have a gardener. Um, let's dig a pit in the garden and put some wood and stuff in it so that we can light it on fire and toss the body into it to destroy the, to burn the body. Preferably at, at the window. We don't, the, the time of getting the body to destroying it needs to be pretty quick. We can prep the wood also with uh, some kerosene. There's lots Oscar, of weeds, too. We've got to be careful. Yeah. Oscar, are you going to go into nowhere or, or be a part of the distraction? I wouldn't send you uh, anywhere alone. A to- Torun should not go alone, no. I figured one of us would go with one and one of us would go with the other. Oh, right. I'm, uh, I'm pretty good at, despite this, I'm pretty good at getting killed. Um, well. I don't know. What, what does that imply to you in terms of best choices? If, if, you are, if you are good at staying alive, perhaps you would be best used in the team distraction. I have no help at, I, I'm more likely to I, be I a... Think, I think the three of you should go in okay. because you can keep each other safe. Okay. Well, right. That's also the the realm we don't understand as much. So maybe it's better to, yeah. Okay, that's true. You, Father, you and, and Soren could always seek refuge in the chapel, if nothing else. Right. Okay. We'll be fine. Go, with Godspeed. Sounds like you've got a plan ready. So it's now just a case of waiting for the sun to arc through the sky and hit the horizon. So as we gear up to a climax, uh, we've got another two hour mark hit. Do people want another quick uh, five minutes to hit the toilets or restroom and then plow on for the end? Or are you happy to carry on? I'm cool, but I'm getting battery low from my earphones, so I do have to switch. Okay, okay. yeah, it's a cu- Let's couple take of minutes then. To pause again. Two minutes later. Right, so the sun is angling towards the horizon. We're going to treat this as rounds, so we're going to start uh, break out the initiative cards for doing combat so we can resolve who goes when and in what group. So I'm just going to start shuffling cards. Someone yell stop at some point, at which point I'm then going to dish them out in the order I see people on my screen and then also hand one over to... Stop. Okay. <laughs> so... Father, uh, Father Neustrom, you are going on a nine. So I need to write high. this down. Uh, I'll, I'll keep a track of it okay. and show, um, basically call right now. It's your action. Now it's yours and so on and so forth. Uh, next round is Dorothy. You're on a seven. Then for Torrin, you're on a one. So you're Ooh. acting first. Then for Oscar, ten. And then for Soren, you're on a three. And then the Revenant is going on a five. So before actions occur, do any characters wish to swap cards with anyone else? Maybe those fleeing the Revenant get like the higher. Yeah, get to get the, the one. Yeah. Does the higher three. mean going first or what? Yes. Low, um, lower is good. So lower, that's what I'm sorry. I meant lower. Yeah. yeah. Did, the better. Did, yeah. did uh, Father, did you get us our, our cross, our crucifix? Yes. You've all got oh. crosses. Right. Oh, yes. Good. I already had a so cross. When is Soren going? Three. Uh, Soren is going on three. Yeah. And who wants a blessing? 
You, you two blessed. keep the blessing yeah. for yourselves. I, I think I, we'll be okay. I'm, I'm thinking that if I swap with the father mm. and I go later, that will give that will let both Soren and the father go before the revenant so they can get a head start and lead the revenant. And then the revenant will go before the rest of us who are hidden. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and if so you want to take can... <laughs> if you want to take the lead, Torin, we can swap. I have seven, father has nine. So if you want to take the seven and I'll take the nine and Oscar will take the 10, you're kind of, you, you've got the firefly. Yeah, then then got I'll, the, then yeah. I'll go for, okay. No, that okay. makes sense to me. All right. And then what do I have? One. You have one. Oh, I have and, one. And Soren has three. <laughs> I have yeah. three. So the okay. one is going to the father yes. and then the nine from the father is going to Torin. Right. No, it's going to me and I'm giving right. the seven to Torin. If that's allowed to kind of do that, uh, like sw- sw- swapping. Yes, because you, you basically okay. do one swap that way and then one swap that yes. way. So, yeah, that works. So I'm going to give Soren a blessing, mm-hmm. which gives you a plus two on one of your tests, any one you want. Nice. All right, so that's my order set. I'm still on five. So whereabouts are you positioning yourselves when uh, when sundown occurs? Well, we don't know. Well, we know in game the way the trap is supposed to work. Mm-hmm. So we're positioning ourselves in spots that block the creature from going in that direction, I guess. Okay, so you're maybe out in the hall waiting for it to come out of the room? Right. And bracing ourselves for how mm-hmm. scary it looks. Okay. And is anyone attempting to hide so I'm, I'm guessing that say you've got the one group is going to be obvious that's going to run off and try and lure it away the others are probably then hiding to waiting to sneak yes. into the room yep. behind it yes okay all right those of you that are hiding so that will be Torin and Soren, i'm guessing and and uh dorothy oh, and dorothy right so you'll i'll move those cards over slightly so you've got your group set. So the ones that are running are, I mean, the distraction are Victor, the father, and Oscar. Or by Oh no, and Soren. So it's Soren. the father oh, and right. Soren are running. Right, and then the other three are going into nowhere. Yes. Gotcha. All right. Because you are hiding, you don't necessarily want to see this thing. Or do you? No. Nope. Nope, I'm good. So you are at least so well hidden that you haven't even got line of sight on this thing. I think that I'm probably going to have to peek. I don't, okay. you know. In which, in which case, nightfall comes and there is almost the sound of something dropping as if something hit the floor, like maybe a sack full of sand. And then the creaking of a door where previously there was only blank wall in that in that room that was set up with all the remnants of Emma's possessions left where they've been just sat for the last 150 years. This door creaks open. And for a moment, there's just silence. And then this ruffling sound or at least the sound of wind and motion. And finally, this awful sound that's almost like something with a raspy voice just continually inhaling and just seeming to get closer and closer and closer until it emerges out from this, uh, from this open doorway. The thing almost has to expand and kind of unfurl itself as it comes out through this small gap it almost impossible that something so big could come out such of a, of a small entranceway. The creature's about between eight and nine foot tall, elongated limbs, this roughly skeletal face with two large globe, globular burning blue eyes that almost burn like fire in its face. Long protruding teeth, almost like uh, saber-toothed tiger's long claws at the end of its long hands and feet, these 
giant almost roughly triangular feet that come up in this large pointed almost sharp heel and this wide spraying open um open front of its feet with these long claws that come off the front those of you that are seeing it it is a fear two test so you need to roll your choice of logic or empathy as you all... do we not see it yet it hasn't come out of the room into the hall it's in the room at the moment Right. So, so, but it will come out into the it will come out into the corridor. But right. unless uh, Oscar is peeking, unless he does anything really adverse, reacting to this uh, to this test, you do have people around you. And for benefit, as you are acting as a group, we'll still take it that you get plus three. So you have your logic or empathy. Add three for the number of PCs that are with you, and then don't think you have brave or safety in numbers. No, so, but I rolled two sixes in the first four, so I'm relieved. Yeah, you're fine. Um, you're able to hold yourself together. But yeah, this thing, as well as having this utterly repulsive, ghastly appearance, there is this odor of excrement and urine that follows it wherever it goes. It smells vile and it looks ghastly. And as it just moves through the room with this... <sighs> intake of breath that never stops it goes out into the corridor and that's when the others will see it there so we'll try to can, kind of uh, drive it down the hallway the way we want it to go yeah can the uh, the father and soren give me fear tests as well please how do we know them uh, logical empathy your choice got it okay add then... additional plus three for having the group with you even though you say you're not Physically in the same place, but well, you're like a wall dividing you. But you are acting as a group, so I'll be I'll be kind and give it to you for acting as a as a cohesive unit. And I'm brave. And plus one dice for being brave. Yes, right. I got two sixes. Ooh. Here we go. Oh my gosh, that was close. Seven dice, one six. Right. Uh, so Soren doesn't get the two required. Oh, it's two. Oh no, yeah, it's a it's a fear two check. So you you have you remember you got the can he use the blessing? Not on fear checks, I don't think. Oh. It says on anything. <gasps> to to oh to a test of their choice. So yes, if you wish to use it on fear, we'll say you can use it on fear. And what does that do? Allow me to roll one more die? Two more. Two more. Two more. Uh, okay, yeah. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Come on, please. Be good, be good, be nice. Oh, come on. No, that also failed. Right. This is, where you, this is where you potentially might want to play the odds. So at the moment, if you let it, if you let it run, then you're going to take one condition but you're also going to then be terrified for 1d6 rounds, which could be that you attack it, you flee from it, you cower from it, you fall, you faint, which puts you out of the puts you out of the action for potentially up to six rounds. Or, or you can take a condition anyway and re-roll every dice that wasn't a six and hope that you get the second success so you don't take any further conditions. Okay, I'm I'm going to do that. Terrified. I'm going to do that because I only got, so that was seven plus the two more. That was, that was nine. So I keep the six out. So I get to roll eight dice. Yep. And just and all I'm you need is one six. I'm not going to say what I would ordinarily say. Oh yes. Look at that. I got two more sixes. So a total of three sixes. There you go. So you still take the condition. So it's a mental condition that you take because yeah. fear test is based off your mental stats. So I'm angry now. <laughs> I but, can fix that. <laughs> but you are still capable of action. That's the key thing. So, back one. foul sp spirit. <laughs> right. So you're you're trying to compel it, or at least force it force it backwards by hold by holding the cross up to it. Right. Right. That will be. Uh, give me a manipulate uh, manipulation roll. Manipulation, empathy, four, six. Uh, two sixes again. The dice like you. They hate they me do. whenever I play this game. <laughs> <laughs> 
right? Um, you force it up, and as as per your plan, this thing gasps. Its eyes flash with a uh, glitter of blue flame. It turns and starts fly- fleeing in the direction of your little maze. Okay. All right, that's one, three. Soren, over to you. Um. I will, let's see, it's going in that direction, I guess. Yeah. I guess we want to move in that direction, kind of follow it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we want to push yeah. into that room. So, and yeah, I'll, put the... I'll keep going. I'll try to in, continue the intimidation factor. I mean, maybe it can help. Okay, again, you can roll me in. Uh, you can roll me manipulation as well. All right, and that's, uh, okay, so that's... Three, four. That's not a lot, but okay. Hey, wow! I got two sixes out of four dice. Wow! There you go. This is very yeah. easy, right? You um, you also head round the corner where it's it had retreated round uh, around the corner to be basically out of line of sight of the cross. You come round and are brandishing one of your own. This thing hisses and then moves further along the corridor. So you are progressively forcing it further and further ahead of you. Next up is the Revenant. Hey, you are both holding crosses, which is a, which is a major pain in its ass. So, um, it can't attack you, but it can certainly do stuff to your environment. So, magic. I have nine dice. So four, five, six. That sounds like a lot of dice when it's aimed our way. Yeah. Well, I say it can't aim at you, but I say it can affect the environment. It's going to set the corridor on fire. Oh, dear. Right. Even though there's crosses on the walls. <laughs> oh, no, there's tar. There's tar everywhere. Oh, All this Jesus is- Christ. They're screwed. Oh, my God. Oh, bollocks. <laughs> oh, bollocks. <laughs> we like that. Right. You um, you may get to make a force test for both of you. Okay. Force test. Okay. Force test. Force. So this is just your force stat. So your character. Oh, oh there it is. The sheet. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, wow. Look at that. My force is super duper. Okay. I failed. Okay. Boom. Uh, wow. Well, one six. One is all you need because one is all I got. Okay. So, take so nine dice, one single success. So, as it just, it just gestures with both of its hands across the corridor. And the walls immediately, as say, nice, lots of tar here, lots of flammable stuff, it erupt in, fi- in flame. And while Soren is able to kind of dodge out of the way, but at least be outside of an area, you get pretty warm, but you don't get yourself set on fire. Um, the father's robes catch fire. So you take uh, one condition at this point in time. That's a physical condition? Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and that's exhausted? Yeah, it can Do be. they go in order? Wish, yeah. it's, uh, it's your choice of which one uh, kind of reflects uh, how oh, you are reacting I, to it. I'll, I'll say battered is really what, because I'm set on fire. Okay. Um, okay. Now, when it comes to round to your next turn, if you're, yeah, you can start patting it out. It's an agility roll to be able to put yourself out. You need okay. one, you need one success. But if you fail, I get to make a roll and potentially the fire might spread to other parts of your body and become even more of a problem for you to try and put out. Oh. But we'll get to that in your in your round in your next turn. So that's five. Next is seven. Torren. Into the breach. <laughs> into <Yeah>. nowhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you cool. run forward into the dark. Yep, out of out of our out of her hiding under the wherever we were concealed ourselves in that room, just yeah, probably un, under the bed in the wardrobe. Just... Close enough. And now, I mean, my my dog is pretty disciplined as a hunting dog. Could it have been not moving with us? Yeah, I like its vigilance. It's got a good nose, and I have no idea what the hell's waiting behind that door. It's all right, dog. Let's go. Right, you rush on forward. I take it that uh, Dorothy on nine and Oscar on ten are doing the same thing. Yes. Right, the three of you then emerge into, uh, after having dived down this corridor, this corridor itself is 
it almost resembles an underground passage that it just goes off into the dark as if it was some kind of subterranean tunnel. But off ahead of you, um, after what seems to be a few moments, perhaps, it's, it's a bit hard to judge exactly how long you're running, that you can see a blue light emerge from the darkness up ahead. And you run, I say the three of you, in quick succession into what looks to be a hexagonal room. There are around you, so six surfaces, there's an arch in each of the six entr uh, the six ways out of here. The only arch that's marked is the one that you came in by, which has a little cutout of what looks to be a lock or well, there's a symbolic representation of a lock in the keystone above the arch you, uh, you enter by. The light in this room that otherwise again, has this very subterranean feel to it, it feels very much like you're underground, is a blue ball of what seems to be almost first at first glance maybe crystal but as you gaze at it is completely filled with blue fire which just illuminates the room but the light doesn't go beyond the end the archways into the dark well a little firefly take us to the resting place of emma okay and you start moving your hand around so when do do something fly, and as you move your hand, as you go across to the the archway that's immediately in front of you, the little firefly lights up. All right. Okay, back to the top of the round. So, one, the father, you wish to put yourself out. Um. Yeah, but I'm still holding up the. Can I still hold up the cross while I'm doing it? Yeah, you you can do. Right. So give me an agility roll. You need one success. Agility is okay. three. I did not make it. Ooh, right. So I roll one dice. Oh, I get a six. Oh, uh, Go ahead. Uh, a quick action. A uh, quick action. Uh, as can I? Can I stomp him out for a quick action? Can I? Pat him down for a quick action. Let me just check the slow actions and fast oh. actions. So, so, so this isn't aimed and methodical. This is more like, you know, oh, shit, there's some, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, gosh, there's some fire, and, and I just sort of go right it, for it. It's, it's all right, my son. There, there's, there's a situation acceptable terms. <laughs> And right I mean, now I'm yelling, fuck, fuck, I, fuck. I, 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 I mean, we just hit shit on the studio. studio. Sorry. No, things are, no things are bad. But I'm even holding this and it's <laughs> terrible. It's not worked work better. Sorry. Uh, it wouldn't be a fast action. It would be oh, a slow God. action. But oh. you could attempt it to try and put him out. Put out a candle is a fast action. That doesn't count. <laughs> okay. yeah, he's, he's a bit. He's a, he's a bit bigger than a candle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. I, I My goal was, was to to try to preempt before he took more damage was what I wanted. So, if, oh, okay. So could I try? Uh, I'll, I'll buy it for that because you're only, well, you're only two down or two up the initiative order from that. So after uh, your uh, agility attempt, I will then roll the die to see if the, uh, see if the flame increases. Okay. Okay. So I do agility. Okay. I can do this now. I can do this. I've got agility. I've got, whoops, that's the wrong chart. This is it. Agility, stay on target. Okay, okay, agility. All right, so I can do this. Come on. Oh, funny. Uh, nope, nope. Uh, one, one, two, three. It's fanning the flame. That's yep. a big fail. <laughs> okay, so let's see if the flame gets bigger. Bye, everybody. <laughs> no, I rolled. I rolled. A, I rolled a one, so it is still a small flame. So, as of next round, you still only need one success uh, to get out of it, but it is still burning. So you take another condition this round. Okay. I remember these are going to be cumulative yeah. minus ones on your physical actions. As well, so it becomes a bit of a death spiral. Don't die. <laughs> Yeah, unless uh, Soren wanted to take a, uh, take a condition and try and uh, re-roll the agility, the agility dice. Oh, oh, oh! But the, the condition oh. drive drive the creature back. 
Yeah, drive, I'm gonna have drive it back. Yeah, I gotta stay focused on the creature. Actually, right. if Soren gets ahead of me to drive the creature back, then I can just take off my damn rope. <laughs> yeah, you can you can <laughs> drop and, and tumble. Drop and roll. That that'll be that'll be on the next round. So both yeah. this round, both uh both the father and Soren both tried to put out the father and didn't get too far. So at the minute, the thing is still forced up, forced back, but you're not pushing it any further back this turn. It's just standing there. And if it doesn't advance, but it decided likewise doesn't pull back, um, can't do anything directly against you. It's already set the corridor on fire. That's it's content to wait at this point. And hopefully what, what you burn. So, that moves us round to seven, which is now that my screen has completely changed because of the range. Torrin. All right. So, I mean, I still have the firefly. I'm seeing if it's flickering colors. Um... It seems to light up when you've, uh, you've asked your question to it, or at least you put your command to it. And then once you've moved it around, it lights up when it meets a particular doorway off here. Yep. And that's where, yep. Heading that way then. Just keep following the firefly. Yep. Right. And you're moving up first, presumably, as you're the first one to yep. act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I have a D6 roll, please? Oh. One. Okay. You all move forward. Presumably you're doing the same as before, rush, uh, rush into the dark. And as you rush forward, not only is it that it's very dark in that corridor, everything goes completely black. Uh, can I have another D6 roll, please? Six. Ooh, okay. Once you wonder, you're looking around wondering what, what is everything that you suddenly can't hear everyone around you it's just the light's gone the sound's gone everything's gone and as each of you is trying to twist and turn and find out any form of reference even trying to hit the wall with your hand or try to grab uh, grab anyone in front of you you realize your limbs are being held and that what was once horizontal um, horizontal suddenly goes vertical you're lying down on what seems to be almost like a, a wooden bench uh, around you there's these benches around the room and uh, around this circular room or roughly circular maybe hexagonal it's a bit hard to tell from your position with hooks coming down from the walls upon which implements are hung and this female figure that just seems to be like a giant leans over the table and in that moment we think well she can't be that big it, you realize it's because you're really small and that you are strapped down onto this bench as this female figure that we presume to be Emma with relatively short cut hair, this malicious grin on her face just says, well, I'm, I'm almost disappointed. It's this easy to harm you. I was hoping you'd last longer as there's nothing that you can give me now. I just guess I'll have to enjoy the time we have left together as she reaches forward with a series of what looks to be almost a set of pliers that she grabs hold of your leg and starts to tear you limb from limb. Um, can you each give me fear checks, please? Oh, good God. <laughs> we get plus three because we're together. Uh, you do not see anyone else around you. Oh, so uh, for this purposes, you do not get the plus three. Nothing. Nope. Uh, Oscar's also, yeah. Uh, I'll say no sixes. Right. Now, this could potentially slow you down quite a bit if all of you are going to uh, go into being terrified. So it's potentially 1d6 rounds that you are going to be gripped by fear. Do people want to push the roll, take a condition, but obviously then if you do succeed, all you need is, all you need is one six that it would mean that you don't have to worry about losing D6 rounds. I'll push it. Sure. Yep. Pushing it. Yeah. Ditto. Okay. No. Maybe. <sighs> <laughs> ah, yes, two sixes. One, one, yes. Okay, so Torrin is uh, out of it for roll one D6. Three. 
Okay, so Torin is out of it for three rounds as he's gripped by effectively part of this prison is that it would reflect back all the tortures that Emma did back on herself from the perspective of being the vason in uh, in her torture. Uh, you're out of it for three rounds and you're the one with the firefly. So uh, you take two conditions. You take the one for pushing and the one for, fi uh, for failing the fear check. Whereas the others only take the one for the push. And it's mental, right? Yes. Yeah, I got angry as the push, and now I feel hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> Especially as you're angry. Your anger does nothing. Yeah, great. Right. And we're back round to number one. Well, took, I'll describe nine and ten. Uh, you, as you push through this, realizing that as you're being ripped apart, something in the back of your mind tells you that this is just some kind of memory or trick or fey, fey illusion. You then push through and stumble into a room that looks pretty much like the one that you just saw in your, in your mind's eye. There is a bench in the middle of the room. There are these horrible implements which are hung all around you on hooks and chains from the walls and on benches, the smell of feces and urine is uh, intense in the room, as is the smell of decay. And poking around on the floor from behind that table, you can just see two skeletal, almost mummified feet poking out of a corpse that's evidently on the other side of the, the, other side of the bench. Background to the father on number one. Do you want to try and give me a roll to uh, put yourself out again? Yes. Okay, agility, please. Agility. Now, uh, let's see. Maybe wait a second. Hold on. Agility. I've. I don't have any in agility. I do have three in physical. But now, don't I have two minus ones? If you've got two conditions, yes. Because that would only give me one dice. That'd be um, tough. I'm wondering if if he ran forward, can I just take off the cassock and throw it to the ground? That's probably what's on fire. It's it's all that's part of what your agility role manifest is is called shedding right. the burning clothes. One dice. Look. I got a six. On a As red on a red dice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> As described, you literally just launch yourself out of your burning clothes. You're somewhat scorched and singed and in a great deal of pain, but you're no longer on fire. All right, cool. Soren, you're up. Oh, Get okay. this damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give me another manipulation roll. All right. Uh, let's see. Go. That's right. This is not getting any better. It's just empathy. And if you okay, here it is. Okay, come on, please. A six somewhere in here. Oh, one six. One three three six. Okay, that means you've reached a cumulative five in terms of pushing it back. You now have it where you want it. So if you wanted to bar barricade it into a room, as you were, I think, discussing, that it is now in that room at the far end. Father, get painting those crosses. <laughs> um, I okay, I'll, that's what I'll do in the next round, I think. Right? Well, you can use a fast action because, as uh, Torren did, uh, did state that you're putting pretty much everything in place apart from just a single brush stroke across. Okay, that I would count that as being a fast action to just go whoosh. How do I do a fast action? Just you just you just declare you're doing it. Okay, I'm doing it. I'm putting the, the crisscross on the, the bar. On the, right. on the cross, and at which point you have a very, very angry uh, revenant inside the room. On a five, yeah, it's going to, it's going to lash out in any way, shape, or form it can do. Uh, you see the room completely; the interior is suddenly engulfed in flame, and you can start to smell burning wood. Damn that but, thing! So we've, got to, on, we've got to get that thing killed. Um, depending on how long it takes to get out of there, roll its, roll its dice. 
Would you believe I'm nine dice? Zero. <laughs> These old houses are built really strong. Oh, yeah. It gives me time to get my shit together. <laughs> it's also super moldy, so mm. all the fire is right. like. Yeah, it's all it's all the uh, it's wet. Yeah, yeah, it's all. Well, the it was along. raining, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's probably the room above. It's got a big hole in the roof, and it's just got a like a swimming pool full of water up on the, <laughs> the floor above it. So, uh, Torrin is currently going in in his nightmare vision, whereas the other two of you find yourselves in the torture chamber, and round the back of the table is the remains of what was once Emma Bockfist. Where's Torun? We we can't leave without Torun. We, Oscar, let's let's grab that body at least. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm, I, well, yeah, it is my turn. I'm grabbing the body, but I'm gonna stay put, and I'll I'll say that too. Like I I think we should. We can't. We're we're gonna get stuck in here without that firefly. I don't I don't know what happened to Torun, but maybe she'll come back. I don't. Uh, uh what's the um. What's the uh, body seem like? Is it? Yeah. She's what? What it looks like has happened is that she was curled up in a semi-fetal position, just with her feet sticking around the back edge of the table, and that it looks like she had just laid down there and finally given up all hope. Um, around her, in an arc on the floor, is just a series of scratches. That like one, two, three, four, scratch through for five, as you're not sure if it's hours, days, or however long it might be that she was trapped down here, but she just laid down and gave up. And in a final act of defiance was, I'm just going to wait until I either die of thirst or die of hunger and just counted down time until it finally happened. So there's this yeah. Yeah, mummified corpse that's left there. Very dry, very, uh, very brittle. So if you did want, if you did have anything you wanted to try and set it on fire with, you could probably do it here. Oh, that's right. We need to set it on fire. Um, I don't know that I have anything. Do, Oscar, do you smoke? Uh, um, I, that uh, is a, a vice of the wealthy. Um, I'm practical there. So I can probably strike something together if there's material appropriate. Well, or we can look around. You've got, got a crowbar. crowbar and you've got stone. So if you want to try and get a spark going. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, normally, doing, rip, uh, doing rituals don't require rolls, but this is a bit more of an improvised step to try and get uh, to try and get to your end goal here. Do you want to give me a force roll to see if you can strike the ground hard enough to try and get a generator spark? Surely. Uh, physique is five and force is one more, so I've got six dice. Uh, and I've got four sixes. Four? Yeah. I've right. got four sixes, a five, and a one. There is, you seem to hit whatever part of the stone you hit. It not only gives a single spark, it's like a firework going off as you just rake the metal across the ground. Sparks fly and she is like a tinderbox because there's no moisture has made it down here. And she is, she has been lying there in state for a long, long time. Her clothes start to smoke and quickly, almost like a Roman candle, she just erupts in flame. And for the father and Soren outside, as you realise, or as it realises what's happening, you can see it start trying to bang on the door, trying to get out, trying desperately to uh, get back and flee back to its body to stop whoever's doing this to its remains. And... Not only is the room going up in flames, she goes up in flames with them. And this awful, terrible, loud screech and scream fills the entire castle for what may only be a few seconds, but will permanently be ringing in your ears. This is not a sound you will forget lightly. They'll finally, the remains of what was once Emma mingles with the flames and they, them, they themselves extinguish. 
Uh, Torrin just staggers out from the dark a few round, a few moments later. Oh, Firefly God. still in still in hand. But there's Let's a nice the little fire there. You could if you had some marshmallows, it'd be quite toasty. <laughs> Let's get the hell out of here. Yep. Right. I presume then with your little guide, you turn around and ask for the way out. Yep. Okay. Right. We wrap up to a coda, as it were. So the next morning, after having put out the corridor that was ablaze outside and realised, yeah, tar is quite flammable. That's, that's annoying. That you've got uh, maybe a few little streaks of smoke heading up to meet the morning sky. The morning sky. You head back out to the mound to take the firefly mm-hmm. back to the queen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Bring, bring that. Bring, Four offerings. Bring, yeah. Bring cheese and, and cream. Milk and, and cream. And just, and just set it there. Uh, I'll let, I'll let somebody else do this. I'm still a, uh, I'm still rather. Uh, I'm gonna have to talk to the yeah. priest. I'm just. Yeah. I just. I had a job to do. I wanted to protect people, and I failed. I failed everybody, and I just hate being powerless so <laughs> that's fear often gets the better of the best of us but yeah the the queen arrives on her litter takes back the or she doesn't take back she one of her one of her royal entourage takes the firefly back in its uh, little glass jar she looks up at you and says i uh, i thank you for for that for taking care of our our former pet and I, I like to think that we would, can be good neighbours. We would like and that if, to. If, if you do require my services, such as has been provided in the past, you know where to find us. And if and, you need anything, mm-hmm. you can contact us. She smiles and nods, kind of think you got to read the expression on her faces. I was hoping you would say that. And she heads into the mound. And as a last image, you imagine that's when the curtain comes down and if there was a mid-credit sequence, there'd be off on a train heading back towards, uh, back towards Finland. There's a lady in a long dark coat just having a flick through a notebook that she stole from the police detective. That The whole point to learn about what members of the society are still left in Castle Gillencourt so they can start planning their next move. The, uh, the Rosenberger faction has a little piece of information that might come in, to, might become useful at a later date. And that's where we'll end our story. Excellent. Excellent. Yay. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, so thought, thoughts on Vason then? Is that the kind of, kind of thing you like? Yeah, it was fun. I like it, yeah. It's good. That was, yeah. that was a lot of that was a lot of fun. I love the uh, the whole research and prep idea of it. You know, where it's like you're going on a hunt, or <laughs> you know, it's you have a knowledge of the mystery and you get to you know make decisions and plans. So I, I found that preparation part of it a lot of fun. Yeah, well, unlike the Cthulhu mythos, we could actually learn about some of these things in order to fight them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's I, I love it. It's a great it's a great little game, and it's it's quite formulaic in that sense that the the mysteries have the same kind of structure. But even within that structure, you still have a lot of you can play around with it a lot. So the the scenarios never quite feel the same. <sighs> it's that oh, finding learning about your enemy, realizing what you need to do, and then ha- encountering a problem that yeah, violence isn't the only way. Well, isn't the way you solve it. You have to find that method of dealing with it. And yeah, there's some, there's some, there's some of the vases in the book have some quite, uh, quite tricky ways of dealing with them. Um, really kind of makes you think, how the hell am I going to be able to get rid of this one? <laughs> All right. Our players included Holly Buto, Stuart Lively, David Gasway, Morgan Llewellyn, and myself with Matthew Sanderson as the Keeper of the Secrets. We have a Discord server where you can chat with our other members, you can set up private games, and you can learn the finer arts of game playing, game mastering. 
We provide audio-only versions of our shows free for you to download from Pod or iTunes. If you'd like to help support our show, please visit our Patreon account. Just a dollar to a month helps us a lot. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel. and Punch the bell icon for updates on our latest shows and leave us some comments. We enjoy reading them and answering any questions you might have. This is Tom Rayleigh, together with all the members of our gaming club, inviting you to journey with us once again into the darkness for another adventure into the universe of Scandinavian mythology and the vase and role-playing game. Until next time, good luck and good gaming.